This episode of Linux Action Show is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. Use the code Linux and save. And welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 25, Episode 1. My name is Chris. And my name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Should I tell folks about the big show coming up? I want to hear all about it. All right. Well, we do have a big show for you. It's our 2013 predictions. Where is Linux and open source going to go in 2013? We'll give you our thoughts today. In the second half of the show, we're going to run down all that stuff. Matt and I have so many predictions, oh, yeah. we printed them out. And then mm. also, a bunch of you sent in a really great uh, batch of predictions, so we're going to go through those as well. And then at the, at the end of the show, we've got some feedback questions, including uh, some tough Arch and UEFI questions. I think they're going to be pretty tough, yeah. but it'll be challenging to see what we can come up with. And then in the news segment, we're going to talk about the little kerfuffle that Linus Torvalds uh, created, Mr. Birthday Boy himself, this week when he was uh, <laughs> taking care of some business on the yeah, oh, Linux yeah. Mail, kernel mailing list. He had some thoughts he wanted to share with everybody. <laughs> and of course, uh-huh. uh, Ubuntu Canonical is doing their best to try to draw up some rumors, some Apple style rumors about what might happen at possibly Ooh. CES or something like that. So uh, stay tuned for mm-hmm. that. But Matt, in the first segment of the show, we're going to run through our picks. Good deal. All right, let's start with our runs Linux. Surprise, surprise, Matt. The Nokia N950 runs Linux again. Nicely done, Nokia. Nicely now, done. The Nokia N950, we've talked a lot about on this show. It's, it was a developer handset, mm-hmm. and it's sort of meant for this kind of stuff. And uh, and Gadget got their hands on Jolly's Sailfish OS. This okay. is a Linux-based platform that's right. going to compete with Android or iOS. And uh, it runs on these pretty well, and it's all Linux-based. And we have a video walkthrough here that you can, we'll link to for you audio folks. You can go uh, check it out if you like. I'll tell you, Matt. Well... I know what you're going to say. <laughs> I know on. what you're going to say. <laughs> but that aside, mm-hmm. look how nice this looks. Well, I wasn't going to totally poo-poo it right off the bat. I had a few good oh, things okay. to say. Right. I mean, I, I, you know, I had my poo-poo bucket out, but no. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was going to give it some I was going to give it some props. A I think bucket. a bucket. I mean, I'm sitting on a bucket. No, oh, okay. All right. No, I I think the phone itself and the the user interface brings a lot of interesting contrast to say like Android. I mean, it's interesting to see the comparisons. Yeah. And some of it I would say is maybe even done a little better than Android. I think so, yeah. My, my biggest gripe is this can be the most awesome experience in the world, but it's truly not so groundbreaking, so differential from like when smartphones really started becoming popular to what they were previously that it's not going to I don't see it let's let me shorten this up. It's not going to break into the market. No right. matter how awesome it is, unless it does something really compelling, like I don't know, they found a way to make cell towers obsolete or something com- crazy like that. I that don't almost, think it's going to matter, right? That's an interesting idea. That almost sounds you, you almost know? sound like you're getting into your predictions here. I think we both actually yeah, have predictions yeah. around this type of yeah, stuff. Yeah, pretty much. But uh, so long story short, I would say that it's interesting and it's yeah. definitely worth checking out. I would love to see it be in the market competitively, but I don't see it happening. One of the things they you they know? talk about in this video is the polish like uh, uh, when when you're on the home screen you can yeah. customize things and uh, when Those you change like say the background for example yeah. sort of like in Unity when you change the background how the Unity interface and the dash all kind of change colors Okay, the UI right. on the phone system sort of adapts colors to match your theming and things like that it so does it's mm-hmm. kind of a neat personalized system I would say and I don't want to go too far down the predictions sure, around sure, here sure. but I would say uh, maybe success for Sailfish OS is popularity in the Asian market and enthusiasts yeah. in the uh, in the other nations who buy h- hardware like the N950 mm-hmm. and load it themselves. I would say that's pretty accurate. I, I also I gotta hand it to them on the uh, just the general interface. I think it's very fluid. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. I, I it's one of the better uh, non open Moco. I think is what they that old developer handset. Oh that, right, yeah. remember that thing? That oh, thing yeah, was I just do. hurting yeah. from the moment it came out. But this this actually looks really cool. It's attractive. It's competitive. It's competitive. Yeah. It just needs to get out there. And if yeah. it can, yeah, I would definitely say this is one to watch. Yeah, it really does. It's attractive. It I really mean, does look good. I don't so, hate it at all. And it looks fluid. It's it's yeah. an interesting idea. And I love the idea that. It's it's not it's not Linux buried under a lot of Java. No, no, it's, no. It's it's Linux running Linux. It's all you know top to bottom, right. which would be really fun for guys like us. Uh, but yeah, all right. Cool. I uh, I always have an Android pick and a Linux desktop pick. I'm always Aww. really excited about the Android pick, and generally fairly excited about the Linux desktop mm-hmm, pick. Mm-hmm. This week. Completely excited about the Linux desktop. Nice. I cannot, and, and we've actually had a few people send this suggestion into the show too, uh, and it's just so so handy. I can't wait to tell you guys about it. But 
before we get to that, let's say good morning to the fine folks over at GoDaddy.com. Woo! Hello, GoDaddy. GoDaddy, longtime sponsors of the Linux Action Show. Woo. And uh, guess what? What's that? See, this they're doing a happy New Year sale, and this is great. Look at this, Matt. Happy New Year. They're wishing me a happy New Year. Look at that. Already? You can get a That's you can get a dot awesome. com or a dot co for twelve dollars and ninety nine cents. Nice. That's a great deal. That's a really good deal. I mean, deal. you know, if uh, if I didn't have a way better deal to offer you guys, what? That's, That's right, Matt. We're still offering the Linux two ninety five discount. That's a dot com for two dollars and ninety five cents. If you use the code Linux two ninety five when you check out, you get that dot com up to three of them for two dollars and ninety. Cents. And here's the thing. Ooh. Here's the thing. I talked to Danica. You talked to Danica? How'd said, that go? I said, Danica, I have never had more success with these Linux 295 codes. These things are so great. I mean, they're just, they're cheaper than I've an app. Them. They're cheaper than coffee. They're ridiculous. I got an idea. I buy one. And I said, here's what I'd like to do. My birthday's in January. Mm-hmm. She said, yeah. I know. She said, I, I've, I've been thinking about what to get you. And I said, you want to get me a present, Danica? Extend it through January. Extend the Linux wow. 295 through January. And you know what she said? What'd she tell you? I'll do it. Nice. So there you go. We got it extended through the end of January. Linux 295. When you check out, you get a dot com for $2.95. And thank you to GoDaddy for the long time. Awesome support. And all of 2012 of both TechSnap and the Linux Action Show. That's so cool because I've got two domains. Count them two. And I've been needing to do this. is great because I can bam, bam. All right. Bam, bam, bam. So thank you, GoDaddy. And thank you, everyone who supports our sponsor by visiting the links in the show notes and buying their products. You guys make the show possible. All right, Matt. Should I move on to the picks? Let's get to the picks. All right. So let's start with this Android pick. Oh. Oh. I didn't bring my Nexus 7 out here. Uh Uh-oh. I'm such a idiot. I wanted you to play with this one because it's so retro and so awesome. Right. Some of you out there might might have wanted a Nintendo Wii U for the Christmas. Mm, yeah. And you maybe couldn't get your hands on one. Or maybe you like the retro games, right? I'm a big retro guy. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, I love this to the uh, side, side-scrolling side platformers. This is my favorite. I got the solution for you. Who needs a Nintendo Wii U? I have got Super GNES, which is mm. so f- right now my current favorite oh, this is cool. uh, Super Nintendo emulator for the Android. And what I love about it is the really... Now, I've played on my Nexus 7, so it's a little right. bit bigger of control. You've got more space. Yeah. But it's got, it's, got, it's got such a cool controller layout. I but it also it. really manages ROMs quite well. I have a ROM directory. No kidding. So this is what I do. This is what I do, folks. This is I what have, he does. I have uh, Super. It's it's kind of a funny name. It's called Super GNES. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have it looking at a directory that I sync to my SD card with Dropbox. So on my computer, oh. when I find a backup ROM that I have for a game that I legally purchased and own forever, and I keep them all in a big box oh, somewhere, yep. I then drop that ROM into mm-hmm. my Dropbox, syncs it onto the Nexus Seven, I like and it. then I open it. Up, I open up Super GNES, and boom, I'm playing the game. Well, now, how responsive? I see the controls. Oh, it's, there. It's, it's, very, it's very responsive. Zero delay. There's okay. Z- there's zero delay. And I, you know, like, I'm a huge fan of the old Metroid, of mm-hmm. Star Fox, of all the Super Mario series. Uh, I, you that's know, I, cool. Oh, Super Mario. My, oh, yeah. That'd yeah. be big in my house. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, by the well, uh, by the well, by the, by well. the way, in our live chat room, uh, Jezrolk, how do, you, how do you say that, Matt? Je- uh, Jazz Rockin says yeah, that, uh, that it works. works well with the keyboard on his Transformer Infinity. Well, that's pretty cool. All yeah, right. that is really cool. That that's, would be a slick setup. I so like that. Uh, anyways, there you go. I'll put a link to this in the uh, chat room, and uh, we will also have a link to it in the show notes. I recommend it. If you have a couple of old Super Nintendo ROMs, which it is now legal to back up. Right. You, you can legally some. back up ROMs, but to understand that this pick by itself requires ROMs yeah. to be fully enjoyed. Yep. Just to put that yep. out there. But if you got to them, mm-hmm. oh, if you got them, so Ooh, much fun. Yeah. It's so cool to get all the old sounds again mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So go check it out. Go back them up. All right, Matt. <clears throat> now uh, the next pick is our Linux desktop pick. Mm. See, most people, yeah. most people, they hold these picks. These other podcasts out there, they hold these picks to the end of the show to get you to watch yep. the whole thing. But we have confidence you're going to want to watch the content. We give them to you early. We're front loading. We're front, front loading. loading right here. We love to we front like load. To do this because it makes it sound authoritative. It makes it. I, I, I like just, the clapping. Sound. That's what front loading sounds like, man. That's <laughs> you can look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> All right. So this week, I want to talk about. NetHogs. This has been sent in by a few folks. It was mentioned on a, on a Google Plus thread. It's been emailed to us. And it's been one of these that I've heard of. And I'm like, okay, I've got to check out this NetHogs. What is it? What the heck is NetHogs? Hmm. Well, you know Top, Matt? Are you familiar with the Top? I am man? very familiar with Top. I spend a lot of time on Top. Of course, of course. Everybody knows Top. You get yep. the top running processes on your computer in a very Great nice tool. list. It's a terminal command. Mm-hmm. Well, NetHogs, probably in your distribution's repo, it's in mine. I mean, sure. you are running a decent distribution, right? 
I mean, yeah. if, I mean, right. Well, check that. But yes. Right. Yes. So anyways, just install NetHogs. And then once you have it loaded, go to your terminal and type in NetHogs. Now, you need to be root when you do this. So you might need to execute sudo space NetHogs. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what you get. See right here, Matt, a very simple list at the moment, right? Oh, that's tidy. So watch yeah. what happens now if I fire up, say, here, I'll launch Steam. And maybe I'll fire up Chrome and I'll go browse a web page, too. action on all some stuff's opening you up see there. What, and you see what it says here. Device, Ethernet, zero. And now it's tracking at a process level which processes are uh, using bandwidth. Uh, and how much bandwidth each process is using. So now you can see... Uh, so if you have a problem application, this oh, yeah. is a great way to diagnose, hey, wow, all my bandwidth is being sent down this pipe. Okay. Yep, yep. So now watch here. Yeah. So now, like see, that. we're not getting a lot of action because, oh, there you go. Now we're starting to get... Now that there the Steam client's Hello. opened up, you're seeing Steam starting to pull through some data some as it's loading stuff up. there. Right. Now, uh, here, why don't I... I'll go load the Jupyter Broadcasting site, too. Okay. And then when I flip back over here, now you'll see Chrome. Here's the... Uh, this to this top one bit. here for Chrome. There's Chrome. It's pulling down uh, 50 kilobytes a second, 15 kilobytes a second. And uh, if I go fire up some activity in Steam, like, say, if I tell it to do an update or something like that, mm -hmm. you get to watch it break in process. You get to watch it go. Now, uh, y y if you have things that fire up in the background, they'll just show up here. So if you're like, God, is something using my network connection? Like, right. I don't think I have anything open right now. You fire up NetHogs, and it'll start listing the applications that are taking... Uh, Bandwidth. Well, it's awesome for the audio users. You've got a list for your PID, your user, the program that's being run, the yeah. device. In this case, it's the uh, Ethernet device being I used. love that, Sent too. and received. I love that, too. So you know if it's Super. over your wireless. Or exactly. You know, yeah, that is actually... And, I, you know, like you know, we both tend to run a little bit of both. And yeah. it's nice to see yeah. that. It's nice, too, that uh, you see the... Uh, so here, I'll load, let's say, let's install Sirius Sam 3 from Steam. All right. right? Just for your So, goals. oh, I don't have enough disk space. <laughs> yeah, Sirius Sam 3 is a big boy, actually. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll try Faster Than Light. That's there we not, go. That's not going to be too big. All right. So here, I'll load Faster Than Light. Beep, 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 and uh, beep, beep. now it's cool because... When we go over here, you can see I get, of course, the bandwidth that uh, Steam's pulling down. It looks like about oh, yeah. three, almost four megabits. But now if I go over here and say I start uh, an episode of TechSnap, right? Right. You'll, you, you get the total, too, that you're pulling down. So I, I like that not only does it break it down by individual application, but I can mm -hmm. also get my total bandwidth usage. So I get a pretty good idea how my internet connection's performing, And, and with the total usage, this is dynamic. This is actually happening in real time. So it's yeah. not like a static total to where you have to refresh it manually. It's constantly updating and changing. Yeah. So you can monitor that in real time. You can just throw it up in the upper right-hand corner Oh, of your totally, right? And just let it run and kind or of Or like uh, with my on. really nice Cinnamon desktop yeah. manager right here, I just, oh, uh, boom, yeah. see, I just snapped it right to the corner. There. Tidy. Yeah. I like it. So anyways, check it out. That's NetHogs. Mm. It uh, should be in your distributions repo, but we'll link to the project page, too, in our show notes mm -hmm. if you'd like to play with that. And uh, thank you to everybody who, uh, who sent that in on Google+, Plus, Good sent pick, it via guys. email. I had a lot of fun playing with that when I saw it because I, I happened to try it out right when I was also doing a bunch of gaming over the holiday break. And so I was loading a bunch of games in and I was doing it through, I was loading games through the, I, I pulled down the Humble Bundle, loaded all that through Ubuntu Software Center, and I was downloading games through Steam. So it was fun to actually watch to see, you know, how the two were competing. I got to say, Steam has some serious bandwidth. They can really push the bits. But it's nice to know. It's nice to have that visual confirmation of, oh, hey, you know, yeah. I happen. Maybe you, here's a great uh, usage example, I think, to where it really hits home for you. You are running with an ISP to where you have bandwidth limitations. And oh, totally, you, right? And you need to know where, you know, you obviously have your your allotted amount that you're going with. You're going with your, you know, your reports from the ISP. But then you need to know, well, how much am I using when I'm running Steam? How much am I using when I'm running uh, whatever program you might happen to be doing? Or how much, you know, now yeah. that Netflix is working with for, for some True. Desktops, how much yeah. is Netflix pulling I didn't down? even think of Netflix. Yeah. Netflix would be a big one. Yeah, Netflix, yeah. Steam, things like that, for sure. But not Jupiter Broadcasting. No, 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 no. That, that, that runs over the interwebs. That's All right. Totally uh, so before we get to the news, a couple of pieces of business. Number one, yep. I want to remind folks about our affiliate links. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, and our affiliate links are down at the bottom of yep. our page. If you click there before you shop or grab our Firefox or, or Chrome extension, mm -hmm. it'll tag your shopping session. And even more than we have linked down there. And thanks to everybody been using it over the holiday oh, season. The really extensions are the way that. to go. It's just it's a great way. To you know what? Think yeah. about it then. And then also, if you want to get something into the show. Yep. You want to ask a question, you want to uh, submit a news story or vote on a news story, mm -hmm. head over to our Linux Action Show subreddit at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. It's a great community where there's generally the best headlines around are there almost always immediately, and uh, you can vote on what content makes it into this very show over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. And thank you to the 2,400 people over there who are helping yeah. make this a better show every single week. And we try to frequent uh, that Reddit quite often. Yes. Subreddit, rather. Yeah. Uh, way more than my email. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is true. Yeah, my email, I've... <laughs> forget it. Yeah, it's just I've, an inbox monster. I, I've got... A, and to all the people that have been emailing me, asking me tech questions, I'm getting there. I'm getting am, there. Honest. So, yeah, the uh, subreddit's a good place to go. There you go. Time. All right, Matt. With all of that done, let's do the news.
Hey, what's new in the news? All right, Matt. Our top story on the news docket for this week. And I think we'll kind of bang through these fairly fast so we can yeah, get the predictions. Definitely. But there's a few we just got to cover. Yep. And I think it would only be appropriate for our first story to be this historic announcement after 12 years of development. 12. E17 is out. Goodness. Now, uh, E17 is the Enlightenment. I don't know. You can't really call it a full desktop environment. It's definitely a window manager with a full suite of libraries that they have created to support right. it. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've been waiting since December 2000 for E17, also known as Enlightenment 0.17, you've probably had some idea that Enlightenment is a win- window manager or possibly a desktop environment, although the developers try to diffuse that and dispute that. But suffice to say, you're pretty much safe to think of it either way, says sure. the article. And the coders are more interested in putting out software that they consider sufficiently done than incremental release numbers. That means they've made some side trips along the way and created and they've created like for example an entire set of underlying portable libraries but uh, but according to the release ch- candidate change log from a few days ago the very latest change is everything's been put together and it is out now and they've put out a really great overview of some of the at least you know some of the high level features and man what? it looks like a great freaking Release and so what yeah. Matt and I have decided to do, and we've linked to a few distros that they're they're kind of their gimmick as they ship with E17 as their desktop. We're going to review a uh, Bo- Bodai. A Bodai, I Bodai. mean, that's what we settled on. Yeah, that's sort of the popular one that you've probably heard of out there that uh, ships with Enlightenment. We're going to review that next week. Hopefully, they'll have uh, their version out that has all the final Enlightenment bits. This is you know this is exciting. Not so much from like a disrupt the desktop market. No. But it's exciting from, uh, it's a completely different kind of open source. Instead of that fast iterate, release, 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 doesn't matter if we break because we need to get people using it, we need to get bugs fixed, and it's this... More slow build, slow Debian burn. approach, kind of you know, almost, yeah. yeah if there, if it kind of feels like that. I, for me personally, I think it's compelling to have that other option, especially with some years behind it. It's cool. Yeah, and what's, what I think is kind of interesting about it is, uh, while we have GNOME and we have Unity and we have. Uh, Plasma Active, and all of these really touch-focused interfaces, Enlightenment is already seen deployment and success. It has. And see, that's where the rubber hits the road with something like Enlightenment, is that if you have a distribution that's willing to go full barrel with it and actually make that part of their user experience out of the box, then it becomes very relevant. And it's about time, because it's a really great desktop experience. I think this is awesome. And we're seeing uh, seeing some OEM vendors take it and sort of package it up and make it their own, and then they sort of ship it closed up. In you know, in the sense mm-hmm. that it's like this uh, locked box kind of thing, but sure. it's still interesting to see it deployed. It's been interesting to watch this over you know the life of the show as it's been slowly. I mean, I, I used to call it DR seventeen because <laughs> right. it was the, the the developer release. You know, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I I just remember going way back with this, so it's kind of a big deal to actually see it ship. Because I'm not sure if I ever actually thought it would. I've been uh, hesitant on it. I've yeah. I, you know I I've, <laughs> and I'm being kind, but yeah I. You know, the one thing is the fact that they're not shipping too early, and I know that sounds kind of silly, but to me, I think that maybe them holding back on it, they're maybe. releasing at the right time. We'll that, see. Where there's enough people interested in experiencing different experiences. We'll, and, we'll, tr- yeah, we'll try it uh, next Sunday. Yeah, and see, Boda. See how it see, see how it does. Yep. All right. Let's move on to Linus. It was his Ooh, birthday this yes. week. He shared, birthday he shared birthdays with uh, Lieutenant Ohura, um, somebody else really quite famous, and uh, some other people. Cool. Very nice. Uh, people I know on Google Plus. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> he he really caused quite the dust up as he tends to do these he days. Does, yes. uh, Maru, shut the f up. Is uh, wow. his, was his opening? How, how do you spell his Maru? I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing that name. But it's a. Uh... Some guy he told to shut the blankety blank up. Uh, a, a Linux kernel developer, and this was uh, on a on a mailing thread on the Linux uh, kernel mailing list. And what what is interesting here is uh, Linus is really getting pretty aggressive in the email. I mean, his opening mm-hmm. line is you know shut the f up. Yeah, that's that. I'm going to say that's fairly straightforward to the point. Now, uh, what I found, what what go, what 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 the cause of Linus's frustration was is that. Uh, 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 a patch was submitted that broke Pulse Audio and a bunch of things in KDE. Okay. And then uh, when uh, it was brought up, uh, the blame was placed on the user land applications instead of the kernel patch, which was changed and broke everything. Yeah. As well as uh, like an error, reco- an error code return was changed, and it was changed to something that just really didn't make a lot of sense. And Linus was pretty co- okay with that mm-hmm. until the user space blaming started. And that's where Linus really erupted. Is like, no, 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 you submitted a patch, you broke user space, and now you're coming at me with an excuse trying to blame it on 
on them. And right. that is not acceptable as a kernel developer. We do not break user space. And he put that in all caps. We do not break user space. I think this is interesting when you go back and you look at uh, Miguel Dicaz's post, mm -hmm. where Miguel mm -hmm. said, Linux desktop has failed. Linux desktop will never be successful because the kernel developers don't give a crap about user land and they're constantly breaking it. Well, see, this would but, seem to be the exact opposite. Of that. But there's the split right there. They don't give a crap about user land. Probably true. They don't, but they, and they're constantly breaking it. False. So in reality, the, the split there is that, that you can't have it both ways. You know, you, if, if they don't, if they did or didn't care, if, there has to be some interaction there. There's no interaction with user land. Mm -hmm. Of course they don't care because they're not interacting with it. Why would they? I mean, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not saying they should or shouldn't. I'm saying perhaps them being agnostic and detached from it provides them with more freedom to concentrate yeah. on what they rock at. Yeah. And that's the kernel stuff. Just saying. Uh, uh. But I do, I do think this takes some of the sting out of Miguel's criticism in the sense that there's obviously a very clear policy about attempting not anyone, to break Yeah, it. but anyone that took that seriously re really ought to reevaluate it, especially now. Because I, yeah. from day one, I... Thought it was kind of yeah, it's bunk. Yeah. It's yeah. just opinion, you know. Yeah, where, uh, where whether or not it breaks something, that's factual. It does does or doesn't. I mean, that's pretty black and white. So there's the basic rough explanation of what the email right. thread was about. What then en ensued, and you know, you can mm. find. We yeah, have, I'm sure the thread's pretty. We have a great wonderful. thread in, on our Linux Action Show subreddit. Is uh, it, we sort of uh, we sort of bounce back and forth between people who are quite offended by this behavior. Right. Of Linus is saying how unprofessional it is and how, you know, he's not creating a team environment and an open source collaboration is key. And Alan Cox said that uh, uh, that Linus should learn how to talk like an adult and speak and, and learn to speak to other adults. Uh, and and we, ha we had a lot of people in our in our subreddit who uh, who who, you know, were kind of on on either side of the fence. Uh, I, I liked uh, In Eight World. This is actually my take on it, too, and I just want to okay. read his comment because he basically says what I was, what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, this has to be looked at in context in which it exists. You don't get to hear Steve Jobs telling off a designer who just broke the cardinal rule because it didn't happen on the Internet. It happened in a closed-door meeting. Mm -hmm. As far as I understand, the kernel maintainers usually work for one of the hardware vendors, and, when, and while they're supposed to be independent, it's possible they are under some pressure by people who actually pay them to get things fixed or to point the finger elsewhere. They certainly aren't paid by Linus, so what else does Linus have to do? Be what else can Linus do besides publicly shaming them to get their cooperation? You can't compare management style in a company where the manager has control over the subordinate's future earnings or employment with Linus's influence over these folks. It's just not the same relationship. Linus took out a can of whoop-ass and let loose because that's all he can do. Well, and another strategic move that this does for Linus as well is that if you think about it, if this does in fact roll downhill and hit us, I'm not saying it will or it won't, but if, if that does in fact happen and this bug exists and we're looking to place blame, isn't it strategic for him to have it to where it's like, yeah, I called him, I called the person out on this yeah, early yeah, on, right. bam, and I did it loud and proud. That's a great point. So, not yeah. only that, but isn't it a fantastic way with a lot of public splash to say, <clears throat> Hard line, no dispute. Our policy is we don't break user land. You know right. all those people that say we do? They're wrong. Look at me yelling at this guy because he just broke it. Right. And exactly. it's sort of like, it's sort of just, it, it doesn't even leave room for debate. It just establishes that's yeah. how the policy is. And he just does that now publicly. And now we will all go forward knowing that Linus's policy is never break user land. That being said, regarding his first statement of that uh, particular post where he basically said, shut the blank up, um, I'm in agreement that it, it's it's really unnecessary, especially publicly like that. I think it's probably not that it's harsh or not harsh. It's just that you know it it, it doesn't really add anything to conversation. By the same token, for people that are offended by it, this is not a, a mailing list that kids are reading. This is not targeted at children. This is targeted at other adults. And if they're offended, don't participate. If you you know, yeah. so I mean, really, it's very you know, pretty much uh, do what you want to do with it. But I you think know, too, for myself, it doesn't really. It does kind of get silly after a while. I mean, I can see that point. Yeah, um, it's yeah. you know really. I mean, I think about uh, it, and I think you know we are looking at it from an outside perspective. What you have here is a group of people who are working on one of the most important operating systems of our time, mm -hmm. and they all have to be A team players. Mm -hmm. You can't have a B and C player in this job. Right. And when you have a group of alpha players, yeah, they butt heads like this. <laughs> I mean, you. I guarantee you. The behind closed doors, people who run large projects like this, really important projects like at Microsoft and Apple and Google, this is what happens. This is how really passionate, sometimes slightly eccentric people operate, and, and it's not necessarily good, but it is at the same time sort of the only tool he has. 
That's true. And that's the true. other problem you kind of have to wonder is well, and that's an interesting point. Yeah, does he have to keep escalating? Like, like you know, yeah, like yeah, I you bark so that. loud, then do you have to start barking louder in order to get people to pay attention? I think you may have just nailed it. I think that in in I think you absolutely nailed it actually because of the fact that if he doesn't maintain a, a, a next higher up and a next higher up, if you are in a room full of A list or you know A type personalities. You do start becoming less and less recognized, right. even regardless of your position. You got to be the top dog. That's that. Okay, now that can make sense to me. So I can see the you know shut the blank up is kind of being yeah the, uh, like yeah I'm I I, I doesn't matter. If, it's almost like it doesn't matter if he's technically right or wrong. This is just how it is, and yeah. I'm Linus, and I say that. And you know the other flip side of it is, for me, it'd be a privilege to get screamed at by Linus. Oh, it would be awesome. <laughs> That's right up there with getting spanked. <laughs> what? what? No, I'm what? Just kidding. no, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm married. I'm kidding. Anyways, no, it's a, I, but no, I, I think the, uh, the the underlying thing that I uh, the one last point I want to make though is that he's going to have to update this at some point. To eventually, we're going to have to start going multimedia in order to make his point. We're going to need YouTube videos. Well, we have the fu Nvidia video. No, I mean like embedded in his little threads. Oh, <laughs> to where he's like literally, it's like interactive. You know, it's like for response, click here. I mean, but an animated GIF of him yeah, flipping off. Yeah, yeah, he's going to have to bump it up because you you will hit a glass ceiling, Linus. I mean, well, I'm, Linus, if you ever need a platform, you're yeah. welcome to come on the Linux Action Show to cut totally. people out. Yeah. We won't even bleep it. Yep. All right, Matt. Okay. Well, uh, here's uh, our next news story is the very thing that sucked all of my any free time that I might have had over the holiday <laughs> season. The Humble Bundle 7 is out. Now, Ooh. we just covered a story about the THQ bundle, and people were a little upset. Mm -hmm. This is back to basics again. It's an indie bundle. Everything's available for multiple platforms. It's DRM-free. And we're DRM. talking some really, really great games. Personally, Snapshot... And Shank 2, I absolutely am in love with. I yeah. want to make out with Snapshot. Um, <laughs> Cave Story is one of Cave Story Plus is one of the best known indie games of our time. It's very side scroller, old school, platformy. Uh, you know, basically, if if you like the Super Nintendo emulator that I talked about for an Android pick, you're gonna love Cave Story because um, it it reminds me a little bit of Metroid. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I can definitely see some Metroid yeah. there. Yeah, which is you know all I need. Uh, that's <laughs> hello. Yeah. You know. uh, now the other thing is, if you pay a little more than the average, you get this. One of the games you get is called Dungeon Defenders. Mm. And what's interesting? Uh, oh, by the way, we also get Indie Game the movie, which is an interesting watch, especially oh. with the, the 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 Meat Boy dust up that just happened. <laughs> They're featured heavily in this documentary, and it gives you a little insight into how they interesting. Work. But here's what's cool. So Dungeon Defenders, the one you get, if you pay a little more, you get uh, you get unlocked. Mm -hmm. Dungeon Defenders is also the first Unreal Engine three game that's been ported to Linux. So you have uh, kind of you kind of have not only are these first time premieres for almost all of these games, not all, but almost all these games for Linux. It's also our first Unreal three game. Now we're going to see a lot more of these, I think, in 2013. We'll save that for the predictions mm -hmm. section. But uh, I got a chance to play it. Oh, it looks awesome. I mean, I don't get terribly excited about a lot of the games that come out, but this one really got my attention because I was such a big Unreal Tournament fan yep. that I wanted to see that engine yep. progress and to come back to Linux and it's like awesome it's such a cool looking game and it's look at the characters yeah very, 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 uh, very cool artwork. Uh, very uh, characteristic the shading, and detailed. The movement, everything's just fluid. It's got the sort of the cell shaded look with an mm -hmm. updated, modernized, like dirty, rugged uh, uh, look to it. Now, Ryan Gordon, we've talked about him before. He announced on Twitter that he was responsible for porting the Unreal Three engine to Linux. Uh, he confirmed that Dungeon Defenders was his work, and this is also the first game he ported using SDL 2.0. So um, and he's actually been contacted by another game manufacturer who uses the Unreal Tournament mm -hmm. engine. Says, "Hey, yeah." So but... I heard you're involved with that Dungeon Defenders. You want to talk to us? We I think we're already going to see more. I definitely think we're going to see more. And what's awesome about this game too is that this is something that the family can play. It's 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 something my wife and I would both play. I think. Yeah. It's not just targeted yeah. at one particular type of person. Yeah, and to unlock it, you just have to pay more than the average, which is six sixty one. Uh, but let's before we wrap That's up on the humble bundle, let's do my favorite part here, Matt, where we look oh, down yeah, at the score. Yeah, let's yeah. see how we're doing here. All right, how's Linux Matt? rocking? Now it's going. All right, so the average purchase price for this humble bundle is six dollars and sixty one cents. Now they've already made mm -hmm. two point three million dollars. Yeah, so they're not hurting for cash. They made two million dollars like in the first four days. They're doing fine. Yeah, I think it's awesome. It's yeah. just going strong. Yeah. But you know, it's it's really is quality. It's reason. Uh, so the average Windows price uh, six dollars fourteen cents. The average Mac price seven dollars eighty seven cents. 
The average Linux price, $10.40. Boom! Linux Boom. is uh, always representing a very strong uh, uh, showing here, I, ever since we've ever talked about these. Well, and even in the pie chart, it looks to my naked eye as if Linux has actually overtaken Mac in mm, that. Maybe. It looks, I mean, I'm just looking at the pie chart. I'm not it's looking close, at the hard right? numbers. It's yeah. very close. But so financially, they're definitely uh, more motivated. And then, of course, in the pie chart, it looks like they're coming along nicely. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, I really liked this bundle, so I wanted to give it a good hearty recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, Snap. Uh, speaking of games that are safe to play with the family, oh yes, S uh, Snapshot is totally kid friendly. Mm -hmm. I played it with my three year old and or three and a half year old. He loves it. The concept is, and I what's really thrilling for me is I actually talked to the developer at PAX mm -hmm. uh, about this game, and I just love the concept. Is you have a little camera, you take pictures of objects, and then once you take them, you can move them around the world. You can so there has this whole digital camera element oh. to it, and this inventory. And if you take pictures of certain things and save them in your inventory, yeah. you get points for them. Uh, and you know it's it's puzzle solving with a completely new dynamic, and it's also a side scroller platformer game. Uh, it. And it's got a fun look and fun atmosphere to it, and my, my son Dylan loved it, and I loved playing it. So. Well, I love the interactivity. Like you said, you take a picture of something, and then you can move it as if you want. Maybe you want to yeah. jump over a block. Well, I need to take a picture of yep. that block, move it, yep. then I can jump over it. I mean, yep. or like, oh, there's lava down there. All right, I'll take oh, a picture of these man. blocks here. I'll 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 I'll, re I'll develop the film over the lava. It falls down, and I jump on the block. It's it's very cool. It's I want that functionality in real life. Take Here's a picture of a big stack of money, put it over there. I'm just saying. Now, not all of these are in Steam for Linux yet, although mm -hmm. I would think that's coming. So you can you can get Steam codes and you can okay. claim these in, in Steam if you want. You can download them directly from the Humble Bundle site if you want. Mm -hmm. Or you can add them to the Ubuntu Software Center and claim them in there and install them if you're running Ubuntu through the Software Center. Now, the nice thing about this is a lot of these, this is their debut port to Linux. It's their 1.0, okay. so they have bugs. They're releasing updates. There's already right. been updates for some of these games. If you install them through something like Steam or the Software Center, then you automatically get all the future updates. So, like when I'm doing my Ubuntu system right. updates, I'm just also getting updates for my humble humble games. Is this something that the uh, humble bun humble bundle can't talk is going to be addressing in the future? Because really, that's kind of a important piece of the puzzle. Well, that the updates, you know, being. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, they see they they t they say here on the site, you know, hey, by the way, these right. are the first, these are the 1.0 ports, so be sure you grab the updates. Okay, well, and, that, uh, and that's fair, but I but I do I think I really like the idea of just running Steam or something like that, and just yeah, having it, or the software center, yeah, yeah. software yeah. center, yep. just getting it done. That's how I do it for updates. Then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I mean, it's like honestly, I don't have time to. I run, that's why part of the advantage of running Linux is that the updates just take care of themselves. Speaking of Steam, Same. our next story, just a quick one here, nothing major to report yet, but a, mm -hmm. by uh, a. According to a Valve employee post on the Steam forum for Linux, uh, Steam is seeking for feedback on upcoming package install changes to make Steam more compatible with other Linux distributions. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So what they're talking about doing is see, when you install a game on Steam, sometimes those game have, games have dependencies and they just sure. assume they can app get install mm -hmm. or something like that. And when you're running Steam on Arch or Fedora or whatever, that's not going to work. Right, right. So what they're thinking about doing, it sounds like, by, by reading through this, is sort of abstracting out the package management part and saying instead, so the Steam client would hand off to this third-party component that they would write, and it'd be like a shell script. And that shell right. script would do all the package logic. So Steam would tell the script, I need package X. Then that script would be like, oh, okay, I'm on Ubuntu, I app get it. Oh, I'm on Arch, let me fire up Pac-Man. It would just, it would... Or I just need to do it raw, and they just pull it from a, uh, yeah. a server. The way they're, I think they're talking about doing it is the distro vendors could also provide mm. their own oh. shell script there. So they could say, oh, okay. so for Arch, and then, you know, that could be a package that gets updated for new instructions right. and things like that. And that could be a really interesting way for... Uh, uh, essentially, letting uh, Steam sort of just have this abstraction layer to it so that it becomes distro independent, and then those distros just have to provide the script or modify the script to work with their setup. That seems pretty reasonable, and it seems like a really smooth approach for Steam in yeah. the long term. Good I mean, for them. So, again, you know, nice. gives us more to talk about in our 2013 predictions yeah. episode. Oh, yeah. uh, but oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's very exciting. I've so. got thoughts there. So, yep, yep, yep. We'll follow this story, and uh, we'll give you updates on it. And, of course, Phronix is always following this as well. Yes. But uh, this actual one came from uh, linuxnewshere.com. All right, Matt. Cool. The next story. Well, curious what you think about this. Hmm. Are you familiar with the Ouya? 
The Ouya. Does that ring a bell at all? That was a Kickstarter. On, but yeah, okay, yes. Yep. I didn't remember the name, but I remember the project itself. Yep, it, yep. Yeah, yep. So that you, whenever this I be say, interesting, especially considering all the back and forth hoopla. Yeah. Whenever I say Ouya, people go, uh, and I say Kickstarter, and they go, oh yeah. Ouya, Ouya. <laughs> so Ouya is an Android based, uh, very small little console that mm. was funded on Kickstarter, had huge success on yeah. Kickstarter. Um, and it has an interesting model. It's gonna be it's gonna be sort of a console to competitor. It's gonna compete with the Xbox. Mm -hmm. It's targeting indie developers, and it has an interesting requirement where everything in the market must have a free version. Everything has to have even if it's just a trial, there has to be a free version. That's fair. Actually it's interesting. Yeah, that's we, fair. Well, well no, I'll go ahead and I'll explain. Well, why. no, you're probably I mean it's great for users, right? Yeah. I mean that's great. I mean, that, well, no, I, even for the developer, the, part, the thing you got to remember is there's a, you know, being able to try something before you buy it, a lot of times, oh, I agree. you know, you're going to be more inclined to want to buy it versus, hey, you've never heard of this before. You it's say exciting, that, you, you know. say that, and I completely agree with you, yeah. but then you look at the Apple App Store, which sells a jillion apps a second, and they don't offer any trials, they don't offer any, uh, you know, they, you know, if you want These wanna... are people with dollar bill signs from <laughs> heads and stuff that walk okay. around in three-piece right, suits, okay. I'm just saying. You know. So the, this is the, uh, this is the developer edition that's shipping out to developers, people that were yeah. like at a certain funding level who are going to write games for it. Uh, it's not like you're not going to be able to just take an Android game and have it run on this because right. it has to have you know a special console interface and all that sure, kind of stuff. Sure, sure. Now, Michael Dominic and I debated the hell out of this on uh, last week's Quarter Radio episode 29 because he's looking at it from a developer's pr perspective saying, there's no incentive for me to write applications on here to make money. And he's like, I think it might be. Anyways, we. Yeah. the other thing you have to consider is they're getting into this at the same time that Steam is getting into this with the Steam box. That's the bigger issue, I think. So that was that was something else we kind of flushed out. But it's interesting. So here is the Ouya. You see, it's it's it, right now it's coming in a clear acrylic case. And it is literally like the size of a Raspberry Pi yeah. with beefier components. See, they're going to open it up here. And oh, he's, nice. Okay. He's going to pull it out. And it's got a little fan on the CPU or the GPU. I'm not sure to yeah, keep it yeah. cool. But look at the size of this thing, Matt. It... That's no. That might even be smaller than the Raspberry Pi. That actually, it's 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 in the running at the very least. That's really tiny. Well, it's got a little fan going there. It's it's kind of cute. Yeah. See, and things like this, at least with I'll just say this specifically. Uh, this is a great toy for enthusiasts, but I think the bigger issue is the end user market. So you know, from a developer's point of view, and I'm not a developer, I would imagine the bigger issue is this is great to develop a game. Is anyone going to play it, buy it, try it? care um it's got you I know, think, you know I if, I mean, if they hit that 99 dollars price point it might be cheap enough where people are willing to try it especially yeah, when you know for yeah. 99 bucks i buy this and at least everything in the market i can get a free version of but how much is a wii these days really i'm not sure yeah see and not only that and then of course you got your little wii store where i buy games but the games the are a lot more expensive there not necessarily so, i mean you get some pretty well some of them are pretty weak but yeah i guess yeah i mean Personally, I, I'm weak. siding with you, actually. I mean, I'm trying to play devil's advocate yeah. here, but I really have no interest in the I, I just, I, Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just kind of, I, I want to see this do yeah, well. Exactly. The price point's awesome. Exactly. Yeah, uh, it's got it's got a Tegra uh. 3 in there. It's got uh, 8 gigs of flash storage. It's got a 1 gig of RAM. So it's not going to do anything crazy, right. but it could play some games that are out there. I think if they could really saturate the enthusiast market with the types of games that they're interested in, it could really do awesome. So that might work, maybe. Uh, Nogal in the chat room yeah. says uh, Wii games for download are between five fifteen dollars. The console is about one hundred and fifty bucks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so. I think you're right. I, th I think the last uh, we bought a Mario thing or something like an uh, old retro Mario thing. I think you're right. It's like five bucks or six bucks. Bronwyn says she's excited mm -hmm. for this thing. I think it might fizzle out within five years, though. So be interesting could to watch. Be. We're gonna follow it, obviously. You know, the little Linux could running be. device. So could be a pet rock. We don't know. Maybe. All right, Matt. So this next story is interesting. It's one I think we probably saw coming for those of us who follow it. Yeah. Uh, Comp is, is shifting from development mode to maintenance mode. This is a blog post by the Compass developer. And I remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, or maybe it was on Coda Radio, I talked about the fact that uh, the Compass developer left Canonical. Mm to focus on his school. He's he's now posted on his blog, and I think he's made some interesting points, so I wanted to read these, Matt, real quick. Okay, let's hear it. He goes on to say, I think it's fairly obvious that uh, at this point onwards that as a project itself, it's no longer viable to continue development of Compiz. Lots of people still use it, though, yeah, so it's worth I... maintaining for those who use it, but nothing more than that. Looking forward to a post-X11 world and a post-desktop world in the near future, jeez, I hope not, I've been personally questioning the need for yet another window manager and system compositor. He goes on to mention that with Wayland, uh, Wayland, you know, this is going to be built in, and uh, Compiz will become less relevant. Now, he does mm -hmm. mention Compiz, you know, he kind of proceeds to list out some of the nice advantages that Compiz still He did offers. a good job there, I agree. Yeah. So, yeah. I thought that was nice. Yeah. 
But I want to wrap it with this. He says, and and this is something just to think about. And you could kind of tell. I think this has been weighing on him for a little while. Mm. Re-implementing an entire compositing engine and window manager just to get the functionality that people liked in Compiz doesn't make any sense. I cannot, in good conscience, continue a project in such a direction that would add more fragmentation to the ecosystem and potentially see new developers pitted against each other. He goes on to mention that he thinks one of the untold costs of open source fragmentation, he says the real practical toll of fragmentation amongst the Linux ecosystem, it's not that there are multiple implementations of the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's that there are multiple implementations of entire cars which do almost the same thing, but different from everyone else. Some Mm -hmm. say this is free software's greatest strength. Now that I know the personal and technical toll of fragmentation, I see it as its greatest weakness. So he's talking about, sometimes it's not just the fact that we have Cinnamon and Gnome 3, but it could be the fact that at at an implementation level, developers Mm -hmm. have to write to different APIs or different different standards for different things, and so therefore they can't just focus and make great products. Everything he said... I'm not saying I agree, but I'm saying there's probably elements of truth. I'd say everything he's... I agree with everything he said, but that being said, I would also say that I this entire post sounds like something he might be trying to convince himself of, or at least giving himself a, a, an exit mm. um, out of burnout. Just my personal opinion. That, but that said, I do not dispute anything he said. He he has a very well carefully laid out argument that I I can't dispute that. Yeah. But I definitely think this is burnout. I don't think he yeah. cares. But don't you also think that in terms of timing, it's a you know put put it into maintenance yeah. mode. We don't need a bunch of new features. No. And no. Wayland is going to solve this problem. Eventually, someday. Yeah. It, uh, but, uh, yeah, no, and I, I definitely think that's what will end up happening. But at the end of the day, I feel very strongly that he probably feels like it's done all it's going to do. Yeah. Uh, as and you he's said, done with it. Ma- yeah, he's done with it. And yeah. he's just, I, he's, he sounds pretty burnt crispy. You know? Yeah. I, and that's understandably. Fair. You understandably, know, he's been, yeah. he's been the single guy on a pretty important project. Well, if you scroll up on his page, it had a, a little uh, picture of an uh, indifferent man. And oh, so really? to me, that, that you know, we, we kind of laugh and jo- I, I laugh and joke about that, but it's. Man. You know, maybe there's something to that. Maybe he's kind of done, <laughs> and he's ready to move on with the schooling and get on to other projects. <laughs> Good catch. So yeah, just all saying. right. Put that Next out there. Next story on the news docket. Just a quick one for you, XFCE fans. Linux Mint 14 and Nadia. You know, that's the, the, the code name. Nadia. Uh, XFCE edition has been released. Always a solid implementation of the XFCE desktop. So this is rocking XFCE 410, uh, and it's got all the other feature, all the other improvements that uh, Linux Mint 14 brought along with it. Linux Mint uh, 14, I think, is a great release. Yeah. Uh, if you want to try it out, boom, there you go. Link in the show notes. Very cool. I want to just give them a special plug because I really think that team does a great job. Now, there was something interesting that was included in that release that caught me off guard. Oh, now, yeah? Yeah, just... uh, yeah. well, it's just interesting. Now, uh, Moonlight was uh, par- part of the inclusion. The Oh, really? Silverlight? Uh... Yeah, Silverlight. You know, that thing that Microsoft basically... Put down yeah. with a bullet, um, <laughs> or, you know, or and, slowly. Yeah, torturing. and then of course there's Novell's uh, Moonlight. You know that thing that didn't never actually did anything. I'm just saying. Like, so they, they list they Moonlight as a feature. Moonlight was a feature in the uh, show in the uh, list there. I believe. Scroll I really down, didn't check it out. And I believe you're Moonlight. right. Yeah, Moonlight. So that was the one thing that stood out to me personally is the fact that they included Moonlight. That is funny. Why? I, I and I mean that legitimately. You you're not going to do Netflix with it. There's already a wine solution for that. You're not going to really do anything with it because it doesn't do anything very effectively. I, they do have some new releases out, I guess now. Maybe that will change, but it's just why I don't understand. Why. Um, you know, Matt, that's a funny that's a funny one. Now, uh, on the on the uh, tail on uh, the tails of that, I also want to give a mention that the uh, Linux Mint 14 KDE edition has Ooh, been released as well. Pretty. Features KDE 4.9. And by the way, Matt, Moonlight. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have that moonlight. <laughs> what the hell? Ooh. Strangers in the night. Okay. Do, 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 do. Right. So, yeah. Oh, uh, unfortunately, due to a graphics corruption bug, they had to remove Lib Turbo JPEG. No, I'm kidding. Uh-oh. All right, I'm just Uh-oh. joking. All right, so go check out those releases from the Mint Project. Now that we've covered our obligatory Mint news, let's talk about some crazy things that Mark Shuttleworth said. And then we'll wrap up the news segment. You know, we actually need a dancing Mark head yeah, for no that, kidding, right? a graphic. That'd be awesome. Okay. So uh, every time Mark Shuttleworth blogs, I have what I believe doctors call a uh, panic attack. <laughs> I thought it was heartburn myself or gas. I wasn't sure. I yeah. I just every time I get a little a nervous. Post, I get nervous, and then yeah. I I think about it. And I think about it, and then the the subreddit talks me down, mm-hmm. and then I'm okay. Uh, so, uh, anyways, he says uh, he wrote a blog post. He penned it, Matt, as they say, Ubuntu mm-hmm. in 2013. Good title. And uh, he goes on to lay out what matters the most for Ubuntu in 2013, and I can sum it up in one word. Mobile. Yeah, that was his, that was his focus. That's something that matters a great deal to him. 
He also, I thought this was an interesting line. I wanted to call it out. He says, and I'll just read the whole paragraph. In this Mm -hmm. sense, it matters most that we bring the benefits of free software to an audience which would not previously have the confidence to be different. If you've been authoring, if you've been, I'm sorry, if you've been arguing over software licenses for the best part of 15 years, then you probably would be fine with whatever came before Ubuntu. I think in a way, he's saying to the RMS and RMS types, go F yourself, just don't use Ubuntu. That's pretty much. In a very politically correct way. Hey, you know, I agree with that. That's, you know, <laughs> I'd stand up and applaud If that. you've been arguing over software li- licenses for the best part of 15 years, then you would probably be fine with whatever came before Ubuntu. And perhaps the thing you really need is the ability to share your insights and experiences with all of the people in your life who wouldn't previously have been able to relate to the things you care about. Mm-hmm. So we have some interest in common. Hmm. Okay. I... I the well, reason, so where my where mm. my panic attack and uh, anxiety comes from is there is not once in this blog post the word desktop that used. No, it, it's it's but and, and you got to understand this is not a focus, and this is something I've been worried about for a while. This is not a focus for them. They are focused on being Apple too, and I don't mean the Apple II computer. I mean Apple too. The they, only, that's kind of what they're aiming for. But see, the thing is, Matt, is the only strategy I could possibly see working for Canonical where they could somehow carve out a chunk of the mobile market. Which let's establish. Let's just put all this aside for a second. Establish mm-hmm. the undisputable fact that the mobile market is nascent. It mm-hmm. is extremely turbulent. You have oh, yeah. you have companies like Apple who were on the brink of complete shutdown who have now come back and become one of the most richest companies in the world. You have dinosaurs like Microsoft who are unable to fully get into it but are desperately mm-hmm. trying and for and and we have no idea what the mobile landscape will look like in 10 years. That's right. Now we have a pretty solid idea that the PC landscape while declining is still going to be huge for a long time. Oh yeah. And it is a sturdy stable established market. Yes, people will tell you that it's going away the reality is just like trucks don't go away just like the radio doesn't go away once tv showed up all of this stuff stays it just stays in a different use leveling off it's not it's the growth that they're talking about they're not seeing the growth of it and so if canonical was able to capture that market it would still be a massive massive amount of growth for them but instead they want to focus on this mobile market which is completely unpredictable now that's part of its attraction yeah and i believe what mark mark is a frontiersman mark mark wants to make a blog post and tell us all about what he's going to conquer and what what they're going to set out and change the future because Mark wants to dent the universe. And I don't think that means he's ignoring the desktop. I just don't think Mark can get it up for the desktop anymore. See, and I don't, and so he doesn't I don't talk think, about it. But I don't think it's a frontiersman thing. I think in this particular case, it's they, they he's looking at statistically where growth is. And, and unfortunately, statistically, growth is mobile. And that's where why he's piling all this stuff in there. If he was going frontiersman, he'd be like, wow – Really owning the desktop would be really hard. Let's go there. I know, right? I it mean, seems that, like just, that's you know. the real challenge. And I'm not knocking the man. I mean, I, what he's done is awesome, and I think he needs to do what makes him happy, and that's cool. Oh, yeah, right. Respect. But, yeah, yeah, but much respect. But at the end of the day, they are truly going based on statistical data. They're going to go where the growth is, and they're What's going statistical mobile. data? Apples and Samsung? Uh, the, the, the market hype nonsense. The, that's the, not it's, data, it's, though. It's, well, that's not data. They, they're going the opposite yeah, of data. But it's perceptual. It, it's perceptual yeah, data. Yeah. I mean, when I say data, I don't mean like concrete, like, like point to a data. I mean, like right. perceptual data. So let's say, mm-hmm. let's say, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, that's what that's what gets them going. So they're going to go after the mobile right. market. I I just I can't see the mobile market working for Canonical. They won't without. I mean, it seems like without the desktop component to it. There's no strategy there. There isn't. If they can offer, and this, I, I don't even know what the appeal to this is, but if they can offer the same platform on a TV, on a phone, on a tablet, and on a laptop, that could be a sell. They can go to a hardware right. manufacturer and say, you want one free platform that runs all these great applications that runs across all of these devices. Mm-hmm. That maybe is something yeah. that sells. But when it comes down to the end of the day, if I'm looking at a, a, a tablet running Android and a tablet running Ubuntu, and I love Ubuntu, I'm buying the Android tablet. Because exactly. there's an ecosystem in place. That's what, you know. And, there's and, and, years of an ecosystem exactly. in place. Years. There are... You know what? Canonical might be able to come up with the most amazing port of Unity to the touch interface that we have ever sure. seen, and that would be awesome. And you know what I would do on that tablet? I would open up the dash, and I would close the dash. And I would open up the dash, and I would close the dash, because there would not be a single application for me to use. Exactly. How do you solve that problem? The only interest developers have in Ubuntu is on the desktop. The only interest the established user base has is Ubuntu on the desktop. The market is opening up because the major owners of the desktop market, Apple and Microsoft, are leaving it, leaving a vast 
vacuum for you to fill, and instead yeah. you're focusing on the mobile. That's right. I don't get it. Well, and here's the worst part of it. Okay, so we we end up with a situation to where, which I suspect is what's going to happen, we have that blend of Android and Ubuntu where they're going to begin blurring the lines, and they've been working hard at doing that. That's great. So, you've so got, what, I'm going to run Android right. 90% of the time, and then I exactly. dock at 10% of the right. time, I'm running Ubuntu. And How then, is that a win? And, and not only that, but docking. How 1990s of you? I mean, really? Yeah. I mean, I, even even if you had some magic wireless specialized super monitor that could wirelessly interpret that a phone entered the room and give you there, there's there's a lack well, of a killer. App, and the other thing I want to mention really, is there's a, no killer application at all. Yeah, a lack of a killer application is is absolutely uh, going to be something they'll fight against. And the other thing that I think maybe potentially the Surface and Windows 8 is teaching us, and and I think it's I think it's the bet Apple made mm. is maybe we should consider that these mobile devices shouldn't be running the same operating system right. that the desktops are running. Apples and oranges. Maybe. We use yeah. them for d dramatically different things. Maybe we will continue to use them for dramatically different That's things. Right. The desktops are going to continue to be more powerful than the tablets. They're both getting very powerful. They're going to continue to both mm -hmm. be very powerful. Maybe, maybe Apple's billions and billions and billions of dollars in selling an iPad, I mean... If anybody in the market should be integrating the two desktops, it should be Apple, right? Because they're selling so many of the damn things. But they still recognize the fact that OS X needs to be a standalone right. operating system. Now, I think they're going to blow it. I think, <laughs> I think, especially now with the or corporate restructure they've done, they're going to blow it and they're going to yeah. try to merge the two. But I think the lessons from GNOME 3 and the lessons from Windows 8 that we are, we are taking away is people don't want the same UI and they the don't. same operating system on both devices. I'm going to throw Canadical a, a, a little curveball here. I'm going to give them a tip that if they do this, they will, uh, they will not only get people to possibly care about what they're doing in the mobile space. Uh, you know, we care about what they're doing in the desktop space, but also this could actually be a real boon for them. Uh, AirDroid, we all love that app. It's awesome. It allow it basically bridges wirelessly and easily over Wi-Fi the uh, bringing my Android experience to my desktop in a very clean, effective way. Yeah, it's nice. Wouldn't it be cool if Can Canonical basically took that approach rather than trying to say, "Here, use this OS," embrace the fact that Android's it for the mobile stuff, and bring and find a way to take what AirDroid did and bring it even further. Anything lacking in yeah. AirDroid, the uh, music syncability, better uh, Google inclusion, uh, Ubuntu One, everything, yeah. just a much more inclusive walk-in-the-room experience. Take what AirDroid did, yeah. build from it, make it better, build from that, and, and make it something genuinely compelling, and then make it enterprise-friendly. Actually work with different uh, enterprise vendors to find out what they're what's going to keep them from wanting think, to run AirDroid. I think you nailed it. I you think know. you gotta you got to respect the fact that at this point, 42% of the devices shipping are running Android. Yeah. I'm not talking about, like, mobile. Right. I'm talking about 42% of computing devices right. shipping are Android. That includes every desktop, every tablet, every phone, every laptop. 42% of them are running Android. So what what you are what you are literally proposing when you're taking Android on is you're literally now talking about going up against an operating system that has a wider deployment than the Windows operating in mm -hmm. itself. You're so you thought Google. that desktop fight was tough? Mm -hmm. How about a fight where you have carriers involved? How about a fight yep. where you have locked down hardware and proprietary chipsets and proprietary drivers? Right. How about a fight where the biggest freakiest company on the internet but also very cool company which has a lot of love and a huge yeah. user base is already completely dominating. You want right. that fight? You really want that fight? What do you, how are you going to win that fight? You can't win that fight. That's right. You can maybe chip away at that with a complete package, like you're saying. Yeah. Be the perfect services offering. You be, know, like yeah, be the go-between. Be, you know, accept the fact that they dominate that mobile market. Let the Google do the cloud yeah. stuff. Let Google do the mobile operating system stuff. But but bring all of your all of the desktop settings and sync and mm -hmm. all that stuff to that. Yep. So that way, when I get back to my desktop, right. everything I did on this Android mobile device is is current and fresh on my desktop. They're in yeah. sync and ready to go. Suddenly. Ubuntu becomes very relevant to a person that's never used it before because their entire Android experience is right there in front of them. But it's doing so more than what AirDroid's offering. It's going a step ahead. Then it's it's about an experience and not about a dogmatic view. Um, and that's that's really what's going to... Something like that needs to happen. They need to be a bridge between two experiences. If right. they're not a bridge between two experiences, they're wasting you their know, time. You know, honestly, Google so, is, is too busy trying to take away Apple users and Apple's too busy fighting against yeah. Google and now they're all fighting against Amazon and you know I, I just want to use Google for what Google's great and I want to use Amazon for, what's, for Am what Amazon's great and I mm -hmm. want to run Ubuntu while I'm doing it all 
And I think that represents the vast majority of what users want. Yeah. Exactly. And some people have actually pointed out that other uh, apps and services have already done this. And I would say, but they've not done it effectively yeah, enough exactly. because no one's using it. Yeah. I mean, not, not on a grand scale. you got to get beyond niche markets of enthusiasts or even just even enterprise users. You need to actually start getting wider adoption. Yeah, I, I like Sword Saints' idea in the chat room. Maybe they should, uh, maybe they should go uh, talk to the Jolly Club. Folks. That would be an excellent place to start. All right, See, that's so, good. So much for that being a fast good. one. Uh, one, uh, yeah. Oops, sorry. <laughs> one last, uh, one last story here, yep, just yep. because this is, this wouldn't be December, <laughs> the end of 2012, uh, without this rumor. Uh, I'll get to that in a yeah. second. But rumors are running wild about an Ubuntu mm. top secret new product to be announced. That's right, Matt. Uh, on a save the date, January 2nd, Ubuntu is set to disrupt a new ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Reads an urgent message that was sent out to the press Ubuntu will announce a brand new product it reads and uh, now this same time last year I read the headline Ubuntu TV to be revealed at CES you know? <laughs> so <laughs> Canonical did this last time and honestly you know this time they've got to put up and, or shut up because yeah. how long have they I, I, I looked back at our previous you know we were talking about Ubuntu TV in uh, at the end of 2011 yeah it's, let me, again, let I know me, there's me, code there. It's let time. me throw it's, a real quick bone here, and and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. You, you mentioned the TV, you know that they're going to do this TV thing. So I've got to go out and then buy probably it's going to amount to about a thousand dollar TV. Or you could take that same experience, slap it on a USB dongle. Maybe they will to pop it in there. Now if they do that, I care. They don't, don't care. I I go with Nogle in the chat room. If they announce a new product. I'm not really all that interested. If they announce a shipping product, if they release a product, oh. then they've got my attention. Okay. You know? Well, that's good. I like that. I'm done like with the that. vaporware, Matt. I'm done with it. Done with it, huh? All yeah. right. Cool. All right, Matt. Well, that's all the news for this week. <laughs> all right, Matt. It is time for us to look into our action crystal ball and pick out what's going to happen in 2013. Mm. Now, uh, you and I have both decided to make it official and printed out our <laughs> predictions because we've got... We got lots of predictions lots to make. Now uh, I got to tell you, uh, we're gonna get a little rough on some of these. Yeah, a little rough on some of these. No lubricant provided. <laughs> well, it will be a little, uh, little, little rough around the edges. You but know there's what? Some hard I prefer to think hard of it. truth. Hard I, truth. I, exactly. Hard truth. A little medicine, and maybe some, maybe some optimism in here too. Probably. So uh, before we get to that, I want to say thank you to the fine folks over at System Seventy Six who are sponsoring yes. this segment. You know, I talked about uh, doing the gaming playing snapshot yeah. and uh, all of all of the humble bundle games. Did them all. Did them all on my Bonobo Extreme laptop. Played them all like a champ. I love, I love having. That. I love having a nice performing machine to play Steam games. Yeah. Uh, now they've got a awesome. holiday special awesome. that's going to be wrapping up soon. Hundred dollars off the new Bonano, uh, Bonobo Extreme, the one I got. Oh, they're still rocking their holiday special. That's For, awesome. Well, I got to imagine. Yeah, that's probably going to wrap up soon. Though. Oh yeah, no, I'm sure it's going to be wrapping and up. And free hard quick. drive upgrades. You know what I love those folks have been sending in pictures of their new System 76 rigs. Yeah. Psychodyne sent in this one of a laptop. And what's so funny about this is he got the uh, Pangolin? Pan <laughs> yeah, Pangolin. Pangolin yeah, uh, yeah. performance model from System 76. Says he yeah. loves it. He was so excited when he got it that he opened it up in the car. You know, he went to the mailbox got, or, for the, or whatever. Yes. He's like, he had to open it up and right he took a picture on. of his cell phone and submitted right. it to the software. Oh my God, that's awesome. Yeah, it looks that nice. I love the yeah. keyboard. Yeah, so uh, thank you for sending that in, uh, Psychodyne. And uh, uh, please, if you get if you get a new System 76, we want to see a picture of it. Email the show, LinuxActionShow, JupiterBroadcasting.com, or even better, better submit subreddit. to the subreddit. Damn. It's just awesome to Share see these the rigs love. in real life. And that looks like a beautiful laptop, too. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Beautiful. So congratulations on that. And, and we enjoy. actually have uh, T-shirts that System 76 sent us, and I will be bringing them into the studio uh, this coming next Sunday. Yeah, that's what she yes, said, yes, Matt. Yes, yes. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yep, that mm -hmm. goes right back to my original statement. All right, so. Okay. 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 I want to open with a statement, Matt. Statements. Here we go. 2012 okay. looks like it might have been one of the best years in Linux in terms of generating momentum and positioning mm. for an amazing 2013. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I really think that's true. I think a lot of the things that we saw were firsts for Linux in a very true. big way. True. But a lot of them aren't going to be paying dividends until 2013 and maybe even midway or later 2013. That's true. Think of it as a savings account for your... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. It sounds, I don't know. I, uh, yeah. All right. So why don't we start with our distribution? That's probably a good place to start. All right. I want to I wanna start with Fedora, and then we can kind of work it out okay, from there. Cool. Okay, Yep. Let's work it out. Uh, all right. So I want to start with uh, my thoughts on Fedora is I think in, in 2013, Fedora will continue to search for what I call its focus. And one of the questions it's going to have to uh, sort of come up with is, do we want to be a competitor with CentOS in a sense, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. do we want to try to become like this... Uh, 
arch competitor in a right. way. Right. Go sort of the role in release. Its home. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, f- the Fedora project's lack of direction and focus becomes more clear. However, enthusiasts will start to leave. Users who live, breathe Red Hat Enterprise Linux will not really think it's a big deal and remain. Hopefully, by the end of 2013, Fedora will be in the right gear and on track, on a track that they can have some passion about. Because sometimes I feel like the Fedora team's infighting and all this kind of reflects on a lack of passion they have as a, as a project. Uh, okay. And I think it's a pretty safe bet that by the end of 2013, they're going to be switching to a rolling release even, uh, even before then. So uh, I also think you're going to see more and more people moving from Fedora to Arch. Yes, yeah, that I agree with. All right, Matt, what you got there? Okay, well, basically, uh, I'm just going to break it down into little bullet points here. I've got uh, basically starting with Fedora is a bleeding-edge distro for those who prefer RPM-based experiences. What do I mean by that? Well, it's gen- gen- definitely a cutting-edge, bleeding-edge kind of experience. Yeah. But it's not really anything any better or different than other bleeding edge distros. It just happens to offer RPM packages from my perspective as a think, casual user. Do you think in twenty thirteen the Fedora project will be like the first distro that's like a package based distro that ships Wayland? Uh, very we'll possibly, it? very possibly. I could see them doing that more so than some of the other uh, bleeding edge distributions that uh, people are popular with. Yeah, I, I could say that's definitely possible. All right, continue on, sir. Okay, uh, unlike Debian, I see its development speed from the likes of Ubuntu. So what I mean by that is it has kind of a, a Debian-like uh, mindset as far as you get what you get, but then it, but its development cycles much more. Qu- uh, much more rapid, much like you would see with Ubuntu. So, I mean, they share some de- sim- similarities there. But the closing statement I would have for Fedora comes down to who it's for and who it will continue to be for in 2013 is basically it's uh, for people that are already used to a Red Hat or CentOS yeah. environment. I don't see newbies or even other advanced users coming to Red Hat or coming to Red Hat, coming to Fedora and saying, wow, I feel like I'm at home here. There's no compelling reason now or further in the year. Yeah. For that to change. That's, that's, that's kind of what I was know. saying, too. You know, I was saying really? Red Hat Enterprise Linux users will continue yeah. to use it. And that seems like that's going to be a, a, an issue for growth for them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it, it's going to be stagnant. And I don't – and I, I, I'm i sorry to say that because I think Fedora's uh, at one time was and, a great distro. Well, but it's and, just – And uh, some of the best know, stuff know. that the other distros use – came from Fedora. Right, yeah. So it's like, and you got to wonder, is yeah. Fedora going to look at 2013 and say, we want to become the Debian of RPM-based distros, and mm-hmm. we want people to build on top of us? You know, they've played with spins, and that's that works pretty solid. But, you know, do they maybe move to a rolling release and say, okay, everybody start building off us now? Right. And and will people want to do that? Yeah, exactly. And, and where their focus is and whether or not, I mean, are they desktop are they i mean centos has got the but, server stuff know, pretty much taken a, care a rolling of. I mean, a I, rolling I fedora seems like the good base for gnome os oh it would be a, it would be an excellent approach for them and honestly it would take away a lot of their headaches so regardless of what their focus is going rolling release would just remove a lot of stress from them i think yeah so yeah Okay. Move on to OpenSUSE? Yeah. All right, I'll start here. Uh, OpenSUSE's core team gets better and better with community communication and marketing, but their corporate backing slips further mm-hmm. away as it focuses on more specific businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I linked to uh, a, uh, a blog post uh, from an OpenSUSE contributor where he says, you know, we need to collaborate or become obsolete in general. Good. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm not uh, terribly pessimistic for OpenSUSE. They've got a lot of great talent. They've, mm, they do. They put out some great releases. They put out uh, uh, some great community interaction. They've got great passion to people working behind the project, and they've got interesting uh, ancillary services. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> Attractive looking, desktop. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's all these. They have all these things going for them. I don't know what it is though that I still I still have a hesitation about 2013 for them. I'm I'm on the I'm on the fence. I would start out by saying OpenSUSE is a distribution I really really want to like. Mm. I really do. I I want I want to really feel the magic. I'm not feeling it, and and maybe and it's and there's a variety of reasons for that coming down from uh, initial user experiences to the fact that I'm not their target market. I'm not an enterprise user. Um, that is not a non. And so for a non enterprise user such as myself, it's just not that compelling. Mm-hmm. Um, th- another factor I would point out is I see it remaining big through 2013 for select enterprise users, both at work and at home. And what I mean by that is I know people that run it. Uh, at work, that when they come home, that is their oh, distribution sure, yeah. of choice because yeah. again, it's a familiarity. It's what they, they. It's a. It's an easy bridge for them. Um, but outside of the enterprise space, I don't. 
really see any reason to get too excited about it. If you're not someone like, you know, you work with a lot of enterprise stuff. I don't. And so for me, I, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean I'm not their market. And so I see a glass ceiling approaching to where they're going to be in a finite space of the enterprise market only. And outside of that, I just don't think it's going to matter. Hmm. So, you know, that's just my, my two cents. We'll see where that goes. We'll yeah, see where that yeah, goes. Yeah. Something to watch. And now Ubuntu in 2013. Mm, you ready for that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so unsurprisingly, probably to a lot of you, I think this is the one I have the most on. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> Both love and hate. <laughs> well, you know, it's just they are they're also, uh, it's just that's the nature of Ubuntu. Um, yeah. Publicly, the project remains focused on mobile. But momentum behind the desktop version continues almost despite their lack of energy behind its marketing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 2013 will be the year Canonical figures out that Ubuntu desktop is vital to their ecosystem, yes. just as music and TV and movie downloads are vital, are vital to Apple and Google's ecosystems, or they will blow it. If things are going well, uh, a major company will announce they're switching to Ubuntu. Some, you know, I don't know how to define a major right. company. It could be the company like the size of Twitter, you know, with sure. a couple hundred, few hundred, whatever they have employees. A company that may have been going with a Red Hat solution previously, or I'm with thinking a... desktops here, though. Oh, oh, you're thinking desktops? Yeah, and I okay. think this is my, I think this is my most okay. out there prediction. Oh. We already know Google has Gubuntu, so it's already, I mean, right. it's already it's happened. been done. Yeah. yeah, but I think you know what Canonical needs to do is to sort of do what, what Red Hat and Microsoft are really good at: is they mm -hmm. come into a company, they sell them on it, and then they cut them a bit of a deal, or sometimes a great deal in Microsoft's case, and then they get them to release a press announcement saying, look what we've switched to. Uh, and I think we might see that happen. Give, I don't them, know. give them a little taste, kind of, yeah. Now, if, yeah, if, that wasn't, uh, if that wasn't a stretch goal enough for you, here's my real big stretch goal for <laughs> Canonical. That I would, I, uh, This is almost a hope rather okay. than a prediction, yeah. but if they really get their crap together and they really want to show desktop users that they're passionate about the desktop and they want to really make the best desktop experience, I think this is what they're going to have to do in 2013 to get people like us to shut up. I, uh, I would say that they need to start a developing Ubuntu-type blog, like the building Windows 8 blogs that Sanofsky did. Now, are you familiar with these? Yeah, yeah. I, it's been, it's, I have not spent a lot of time there, but I'm passively familiar. You're passively familiar with them. Now, I'm yeah, not yeah. saying these are the greatest blogs ever, but what these blogs did for Windows enthusiasts, and this is even more so on, on Windows 7, but because Windows 8 is just a bit of a stinker for a lot of people. Sure. Uh, but what Sanofsky did, which uh, people who are into this stuff, so guys like, you know, like we would be with Ubuntu mm -hmm. and any kind of Linux right. updates, yeah. he did these posts that went into excruciating detail about the things they think about and the things they consider and why they build the things the way they do uh, uh, and each uh, component. A look at their rationale for Yeah, it. okay. And, and kind of what's okay. coming. And you could combine this with their being slightly more secretive approach for big mm -hmm. features and this would be a great way to unveil unveil these and sort of and sort of like get people excited with, of what's coming down the pipe, give the logical technical reason behind them so that people can all kind of mm -hmm. get around a common concept okay. and all have the same common dialogue. I think that would help a bunch, and what I think would really, really make this work is it would require someone inside Ubuntu to sort of step out as a vision guy, sort of like Sanofsky was here, or mm -hmm. you know, uh, or other people have. Now, uh, Shuttleworth is definitely a vision guy, but he obviously just doesn't give a crap about the desktop, so he's not a good vision guy for the desktop. <laughs> right. He's great for the other stuff. So maybe doing. they need to compartmentalize. Uh, he can be the mobile guy. And, well, uh, I have a know. suggestion. I think the guy that should step out for, as their vision guy for the desktop is uh, Jason Warner, the Ubuntu desktop manager. He's featured here in a video that we'll have linked in the show notes uh, from UDS. He's very personable. He seems mm -hmm. intelligent. He seems passionate. He's excited about Ubuntu. Like that. He seems like he would be a good communicator. I don't know. I'm just I'm drawing a lot from this video. But if you had somebody like this who was out there, you know, visiting the podcast, making the blog posts, uh, doing interviews with the different uh, news sites, telling people what's coming, uh, I think the the conversation would switch from. What the crap is Canonical right. doing to this is what Canonical is doing? So basically you're saying instead of talking at their audience, they could try this new approach of talking with their audience. Yeah, and getting people excited yeah. and and you know and telling us that they still give a crap about the desktop because right now Canonical kind of feels like right. Microsoft when it comes to the desktop. Like, it's yeah. beginning to feel that way. It's beginning yeah. to feel like we know best and just uh, deal with it. Yeah. So uh, those are uh, my Ubuntu 2013. Now, I didn't go into, I'll wow. save some of the Valve stuff for later. And all. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's really compelling stuff. I mean, boy, how do I even touch that? I would say, uh, for myself personally, I like Ubuntu, but as you pointed out, Ubuntu's future is very focused on the mobile space, um, and yeah. I see that as being uh, a double-edged sword. It could... Uh, 
perhaps be a win for them. I'm skeptical. Right. I mean, what do we I mean? Maybe, you know? maybe we're not seeing something they're seeing. Yeah. I, you know, I'll go out on a limb and say maybe they're, they've got all kinds, they're full of win on it. Who knows? Yeah. And we'll see what that does to the desktop. However, uh, I do believe, and I, and I mean this legitimately, I think Ubuntu will continue to lose advanced users as its development team lives in an echo chamber. Um, I think that that's the one thing that, you, as you pointed out, if they uh, take that approach with uh, with a better spokesperson for the desktop environment, that we can begin to break out of that echo chamber. But I see a yeah. lot of fanboyism and a lot of, oh, well, if Ubuntu said it's good, then it's good. You know, and I know that's what ticks off a lot of users of other distributions is that echo chamber. It's annoying. Yeah. Um, that being said, however, newbies will continue to adopt Ubuntu due to its easy use. No matter how much we may love or rage against Ubuntu, it will continue to see new users just yeah. based on progression. It's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. That all that being said, uh, missing features that Ubuntu is lacking now and in 2013 could create new business opportunities that benefit Ubuntu. And what do I mean by that? Hmm. I'm talking about there's certain things that are missing in Ubuntu. Ubuntu, such as making uh, an operating, making your operating system completely dummy proof, uh, mm. taking a Zombu type model but doing it correctly. Um, really good backups, you know. I, I mean, where, image level kind of. To where I can, I, st I run my computer all day long, then I take some gasoline, I pour, f and I light it on fire, yeah. burn it, and then I log into a new Ubuntu computer and everything's right. where it was. That type of experience. And, and Linux is actually, you know, in a lot of ways, fundamentally easier to pull that off than, say, Windows is or something like that. So, it, yeah. It, yeah, I would and love the, to see Well, that. and the infrastructure already exists to a degree with Ubuntu 1, but what's lacking is a home user technical support. So there, there's a lot of different facets there that I would like to see happen that I think could create real opportunity for hmm. uh, people that want so to go there. So you think a third party will bring that or do you think Canonical will build that in-house? I think I don't think I don't think they'll build it in house, but I think that someone like myself and a few other people that have been talking about doing this for a while could potentially look at doing something hmm. like that. It's, it's something I'm toying with. Anyway, uh, the last thing I would bring up is relying on the the way we get the word out about Ubuntu now is pretty much done based on you've installed it on your friend's computer or they stumbled upon it from some blog post. Yeah. It's a hurting way to go, and it's and it's kind of dated, and we need to step it up. Right now, the way Ubuntu relies on adoption is a little bit like Harry Potter with wizards and muggles. Basically, we are the wizards, and everyone else that uses Windows and OS X are muggles, and we're expecting them to just happen upon Ubuntu and happen to uh, want to install it. And that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. We're not addressing a brick-and-mortar experience where people can get their hands on it and try it before, before they, they ever... take the risk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of opportunity there, but they need to find a way to bridge that gap because not everybody's buying from Have Amazon. Have you seen you know? the uh, Ubuntu evangelist slash advocate program they're trying to get started where they're trying to... It's like... It almost to me, it seems like a component of a marketing strategy, mm, but they're trying yeah. to get people to organize and spread the word... But but if and and, and the reason why that will fail and will be as bad as successful as the loco teams is if you go to the loco teams from Washington, it's hysterical, it's a joke. It, it's it's it was a nice idea and it was awesome, but there's no motivation. There's an old saying: yeah. no money, no honey. It sounds that, like you know, to me they're trying no, to defer. No like, well, we still want to promote the desktop, yeah. but we just don't want to spend our time on it as much. We'll right. spend the time to have a few people work really hard to work with the community, and those people right. are doing the best they can. But it really is not. It's maybe part of a solution, but I think you're right. And you know what? Yeah. Really, you're kind of touching on what I'm saying, where they need exactly. to get a spokesperson it's talking about exactly the Exactly. And I completely agree with that sentiment that you brought up. I think that's important. The, the last thing I bring up on the Ubuntu front is just simply that, you know, these are all things that can be addressed. And I don't expect them to start opening up booths and malls or anything like that. But I'm saying, let's find a way to network with existing vendors. I don't know. Let's say Computer Text, for instance. You know, they already have stores. Find a way to actually begin relationships mm -hmm. there with an existing infrastructure and an existing ecosystem to begin getting Ubuntu installed where people might not discover it otherwise. It exists. It's just common sense. Yeah. Enough with the loco stuff. That that No one cares. It's cute when it's at a Linux festival, but outside of that, no one's thinking about it the rest of the year. Come on. Yeah. That's a really good point. That's a that's a unfortunately <laughs> honest point. <laughs> you yeah, know. Uh, all right, should we move to Arch? Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so I'll start with Arch. Uh, Arch sees the largest growth from Ubuntu and Fedora defectors. Yep. Arch's fresh and supple repos mm -hmm. are seen as a huge upgrade to Ubuntu's hit and miss repos after a month or two of release. Right. Uh, and going back, uh, so this. This this is a huge advantage that Arch has. These fresh repos. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Darktable. A new version of Darktable came out a couple of weeks ago. And I have a bunch of photos from over the holidays. I can't get that new version of Darktable in Ubuntu. Right. Can't have it. Unless I go download it from their site and their source. No PPA, nothing like that. Well, the PPA is broken. Oh. Well, I don't know why. Okay, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, in Arch, it's already, it's already in the repo. 
right? And right. the thing is, is when when a version of Ubuntu ships, uh, packages are fresh and great. And some really key packages like Chromium and Firefox and a few others will continue to receive updates mm -hmm. throughout that distribution's life cycle. Right. However, it's really hit and miss. Some stuff is missing. This is where Arch comes in as a real strength. And I, I, I as a user, find myself constantly thinking, oh, screw it, maybe I'll just switch to Arch. Just screw it. Right, right, right. And then yeah. I think, ah, I need to run Steam. I need to test this. Right. And okay, I can't. But I got to tell you, it's on my mind all the time because it, it feels like uh, I have more control there. Um, hmm. Moving argument. on, mm -hmm. Cinnamon and Arch continue their hot love affair further and further. I think Cinnamon could <laughs> yep. become one of the major desktops for uh, Arch in 2013. If you're running Arch and you haven't mm -hmm. tried it yet, they're a, they're a really great combo. Uh, Arch's primary barriers continue to be commercial support, if only somewhat alleviated by its growing user base. And my last mm -hmm. Arch prediction is Arch's biggest competition comes in terms of user mindshare, mm -hmm. which will likely be competing with Debian. I agree. Uh, Ar the Arch community is amazingly... It's, the growth is astounding. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Are you got anything on there for Arch, Matt? I do. Right. I have a couple things. Uh, first and foremost, Arch users will disagree with me out of principle, <laughs> which is sad, but go. I but I accept this. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> now, and, and, I, and when I say this, it's because I have both negative and positive things okay. to say. <laughs> Just putting that out there, I accept it. I, I will accept your love. It's good. Okay. Now... Arch is as exciting as Debian to an Ubuntu user. <laughs> and, there, and there's method to this madness. Before you flame me into oblivion, understand this. Arch matters as a base and to someone wanting to build an OS out of it. You know, so if you mm. want, it's as a base operating system, like mm. a Debian, for instance, mm. it's awesome. It's got a lot going for it. But it's not a distro for most people. Mm. I'm not going to put my mom on Arch and expect that to go well. It's not going to happen. All right. Now, before, before I lose everybody, distros based on Arch, however, excite the living P out of me. I like, love it. Cine yeah. Arch, oh yeah. man, it's great. Yeah. It's just fantastic. Because yeah. yeah. then you get all your, you get your cake and eat it too. You got your bleeding edge mm -hmm. software. You got your performance and your speed. All mm -hmm. the Arch benefits, the core goodies, yeah. right there for the picking. Yeah. Without spending a weekend setting up my Arch system, that does definitely seem like those are going to so, get bigger and bigger in 2013. So, see, and to me, that's that's what. To, and here's what happens: Arch becomes even more important, not because it's of of just the Arch users and the existing community, because it's becoming a base. Yeah, because because it is becoming a base, and that's kind of what happened with Debian. Is that hmm. Debian was always important, but it became even more important when other distributions, such as uh, Ubuntu, Simply Mepis, whatever it was, began basing their stuff off of that. Yeah. And I think that is where Arch will see yeah. the bulk of its. Uh, uh, usership outside of your core users, and then your regular folks are going to be over here, you know. Totally you know, we're starting that. to see it, right? Like I could see, so, like uh, on my laptop, maybe one day I load Manjaro, right? But on the server, maybe I load Arch still, or maybe I still. Oh, stick I have with a Debian. I have a desktop I'm running it now, uh, Arch, and I'm quite happy. So maybe maybe down the road we should do a review of that because yeah. I've been really that was remember when I said I was thinking about yeah. loading Arch, and I, I haven't spent a, nearly enough time with it, but I want to do that in Manjaro. Well, keep playing out. with it because yeah. uh, I'm like it's Cinnamon exciting more and more, and Cinnamon yeah. and Arch together are a hot combo. It's like oh wow, you're saving me some time. I'm liking this. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, yeah, oh, you it's know? a time thing. Yeah, it's not a skills thing. Right. It's a time thing. I just don't have the time. Exactly, but know. I want to use it. All right, Ma married, have family. You know, you got priorities. You got things to do. Now, okay. I think this next category is going to prove to be the biggest, biggest category for uh, mm. Linux in 2013, yeah. and it's not just going to be Ubuntu, it's going to be all distributions, right. gaming. Gaming in 2013. You know, obviously, uh, <laughs> Valve is going to be a huge player in this. Um, gosh, you know, uh, Michael over at Pharonix did a great, uh, 2013 is going to be the year of Linux gaming write-up. And you read the headline, you're like, yeah, yeah, I hear that all the time. <laughs> right, right. And right. then you scroll through this list. Holy crap. Yeah. There he, is so much some. going on. Uh, I, I, I picked out the Valve stuff, right? I mean, obviously, Valve's just getting started. Mm -hmm. And we've already seen a direct benefit to end users that have NVIDIA cards, ATI cards, right. Intel cards on every Linux distribution. Uh, I, I feel like... I feel like my Linux desktop has reached a whole new level for me in terms of what I can do with it now. I didn't realize like having all of these games is not just Steam, it's all these games. Like this whole holiday season, I never needed to boot into Windows to play a game. Right. That's and and for a lot of people that's a big deal. It's a I mean, really big. I mean, that's a no more doable. Now, mm -hmm. I want to debate this one with you cuz I think you're going to disagree with me on this. All right. Uh so and this is uh this is for coming from Michael. I just summed it up cuz it he summed up my thoughts pretty well. 
Valve's next generation Linux console. The Linux based console for the living room that's designed around Steam is going to be huge. This is going to be one of the most exciting milestones to look forward to for Linux as a whole in 2013. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, he goes on earlier to say, like, you know, you might not have believed it before, but right. if, you didn't, if you didn't believe Steam, you're probably not believing this, but trust me, it's coming, he says. Uh, Linux, uh, it's exciting that so many levels you'll be able to see a huge growth and opportunity for Linux. Now, I believe you're a bit of a Steambox hater. Okay, so here, here's the thing. Uh, on the desktop, Valve's move to Linux is awesome. There is no question of this. We, we all accept the awesomeness of it, I mean, whether you're an Arch user or an Ubuntu person. We're all digging it. We love it, okay? On the console, who cares? I mean, really, think about this for a minute. How many consoles over the years have come in all excited? We go to console. <laughs> Seriously, it comes down to I mean, like Wii's barely hanging on. As yeah. it is. Nintendo's just screaming barely. Yeah. Making and the it. number one thing people do yeah. with their Xboxes is watch well, Netflix. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's like you know, it's not going to do the core stuff, and it's not going to. People that are into Steam are playing Steam because they want to do it on their computer. That's the whole point. It's PC gaming. It's not console gaming. It's not really there for it, there's no compelling reason so i'm just saying that that's my opinion all right the well, next hold on now hold on oh, oh, respond oh, oh, to that. So, okay okay oh, 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 here we go here's here the thing go. is here's why i think it's going to work first of all uh this this betrays what valve's real strategy is here it's yeah. not about ubuntu it's not about the no. linux desktop they've been improving the infrastructure to a to have a new avenue to sell game titles on right. but b because they're going to base hardware on Linux. And I think this I think their actions so far, they're building the Steam client, they're getting Ubuntu figured out, they're working with Intel and AMD and Nvidia, mm-hmm. and they're really bringing all the parties together is because they are laying the the groundwork for a console. And they're not right. just kind of going at this. Yeah. They're going at it so much so that like when we decided we wanted to go to the moon, we had to invent the rockets and everything to get us there, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Valve is doing that right now. Yeah. They're inventing the launch pad, they're inventing all of that. Right. And what they have in the Steam store is they're starting to feature controller-friendly games. So you'll have this growing section in Steam of yeah. controller of, of like it, it's the app store effect. When yeah. your app is featured in an app store, you just make crazy bank. You just make tons and tons mm-hmm. of sales. It'll be like this. Anybody who makes a console-based controller game, and mm-hmm. there's a lot out there, they just have to be ported. Will will be featured in the Steam Store and make money. Now the catch for Linux is going to be is that console is going to be Linux based. So in order sure. for them to get featured in the Steam Store, Steam's going to require that it be a Linux port. Mm-hmm. That same Linux port is going to be able to run on the Linux desktop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now right. here's the here's the final component in okay. terms of consoles, which is a money generator. I mean, Super Meat Boy no, alone, no. you know, made awesome all of the deal for developers. Yeah, and and Steam. Right now, your your options for that are Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft. Mm-hmm. And all of them suck for getting indie game developed. Like the guys that are doing Kickstarter sure. projects, they're not getting on X- Xbox Live, right? right? Yeah. Uh, the way you get on Xbox Live is Xbox Live decides they're going to work with you. That's right. how you get on Xbox Live. The Steam Box is going to be a completely different approach for developers to be able to distribute their games. True. They're going to be able to approach Valve and they're going to say to Valve, Hey, I got this game. Can we get it in green light? Then the green light it gets it gets voted by the users. Boom! Now it's accepted into Steam. And here's the thing: I can now sell my game on Windows. I can now sell my game on the Mac. I can now sell my game on Linux, and I can also right. sell it on the console. That is the only store out there that can distribute to Windows, Mac, True. Linux, and a, and a console. Mm-hmm. Plus, you you add that I think in 2013 Valve's going to release an Android store, yeah, or maybe in yeah, 2014. Yeah. Then you're going to be able to say well, I can target all of these platforms. And just because of, 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 of Steam's money-making potential, I think developers will come. Way more than, say, the OUYA. No, yeah. See, no, the Steam, I, Steam's yeah. almost a guaranteed thing because even if right. you make a controller-based game and the console doesn't sell at all, and nobody buys the console version, right, right. you're still going to make money from people buying the desktop version. True. So there's really a low risk for developers. Oh, for developers, there's no argument. I 100% but see, agreement. You, but see, then, but then you get the killer app. And then once you get the killer app, the rest kind of sells itself. It could. Okay, so we played the numbers and, and essentially went to the casino and rolled the dice and, and just, and truth, mathematically, if we get enough going on there, yeah, there could be that one game that does it. Maybe. But as things stand right now, I tell my 16-year-old nephew, hey, I got the Steam console and it does yeah. stuff. And be like, does it play such and such that I play on the Xbox? No. No. Does it play the such and such I play on the PS3? No. But, Why do I care? I well, mean, no, that's kind of, that's kind of the, okay, the one last thing. Okay, one last thing to consider. <laughs> There's more people on Steam playing Steam games than there are on Xbox True. Live playing Xbox Live games. And uh, you, you, you combine that with their Steam right. cloud services. So when I, when I play, a, I, bought, I bought a game on my Mac. Yeah, right. And I played it on my Mac. And it was Trine 2, I believe. And then when Trine 2 came out for Linux, 
I played it on Linux and it resumed where I was at on my Mac oh, like it's, yeah. months ago. The Steam console will take advantage of that too. I think no, I think if they can get the if they can get the mind share yeah. of the user and it's and and maybe they can't. But they, I I mean they do on the desktop. They, desktop they they own that. They're going to rock it. They're going to do awesome. I have no question there. But I and it can have and continue to, but I think that you're right. You know, I, I just it's definitely it's definitely it's like not be, a sure I thing. think it's going to be enthusiast. I, at the sure very thing. least, it's going to be starting out as an enthusiast toy, and then I think uh, after if they do end up with that magical game that gets just cr- and I mean it, I'm talking about some dollars behind this to well, promote it. it that, then that yeah. game could be you one know. of their own titles, yeah. Half Life Three, for example. Yeah. So exactly, you get you get like I said, you get some dollars behind it, yeah. and they actually promote it properly. Yes. Then if you get a, one or two killer games, I'm in agreement. Until now, that happens, I'm not buying it. I'll tell you, I made an even better case in uh, Quarter Radio episode 29. Uh, we talked about uh, in 29. We talked about the Ouya versus the Steam Vox box versus all right. the other avenues, and so that was especially from a developer's perspective. Perspective. I thought our indie games episode we covered that, so I think we can leave it at that because I think you're probably right. But I think if they, if anybody can pull it off, I don't think it's Ouya. I think it's Valve. One last thing I just want to bring up though is that my view of the the console on release is that essentially it's going to be just like the Chumby. We remember the Chumby, don't <laughs> oh, you? Man. Oh, the Chumby was awesome because you could get web widgets on this little beanbag and put it next to your bed and it talked to you and all this crap. And it ran Linux. And currently mine is dissected sitting on the back of my desk with screwdrivers yeah. sticking out of it. I just, you know, I, yeah. I, I, that's all I'm saying. It's cool could for be. about 15 minutes. and then Could it's be. Kind of, you could be right. That's all I'm saying. The other thing, though, I think they have going for them besides the Steam. Okay, I, I, then, I'll, then I'll drop it. <laughs> is the Steam box... You know, you can also still build your own and run big picture mode. So it's yeah. kind of an interesting, uh, like, there's already ways out there where you can just log straight in from the login manager right into big picture mode in Steam. True, true. So you could buy a box, you could roll your own box. It's got potential. Um, oh, yeah. As, as, as an idea, it's great. I just They just need that killer thing at the right moment. Lots of press, non yeah. just nerd press, but I mean like TV press, yeah, gaming know. press, and yeah, things like that. Really, uh, you know. I just want to, I just want to polish off the last couple of miscellaneous. Um, Definitely, uh, 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 Firefox OS and Sailfish OS are picked up in Asia, but remain mm-hmm. behind Android. Mm-hmm. Enthusiast devices will see ports of these OSs as well, uh, but to disrupt the market, it will not remain mm-hmm. king. Android will. Okay. My miscellaneous category, GNOME OS, is uh, GNOME OS early versions should ship, uh, like early, early versions, because I don't think they have anything serious planned yeah. until March of 2014. Early reaction will be interested, but adoption will just be among the core GNOME followers right. of the project, maybe this, maybe 2013. Mm. Uh, and uh, I have links in there that go on to more detail about uh, GNOME OS. I don't think we could do a 2013 predictions talking about Linux without mentioning the cloud. This is a- yeah. this is one of Lin- Linux's strongest areas. Linux will continue to dominate in new cloud deployments. The server side momentum will apply pressure to user side technologies in a lot of subtle and interesting ways. Very cool. Uh, OpenStack also represents the latest Linux battleground with Red Hat, SUSE, and Canonical all vying to support enterprise deployments. Linux is a big part of cloud computing, not only technically, but also culturally, and in conversations between vendors and customers. That'll just continue in 2013. Good uh, stuff. And, you know, uh, we have uh, we just have a few here that I thought we'd, we'd just try to blaze through real yeah, quick yeah, yeah. from the community. And uh, we will link to this thread in the show notes if you guys want to uh, add your own. Like, I know we've missed, like, we haven't even mentioned the Raspberry Pi. Oh, yeah, there's tons of, and there's so that tons. subreddit eats that. It'll yeah, be fine. and we'll review yeah. those and look at some of those. But I just thought I'd uh, I'd read one or two before we jet out of here. Uh, I liked uh, the, the Linux journalist comes in. Linux will gain 3% market share. Uh, and he means by that he means Ubuntu. OS 10 quickly approaches Windows 8 in terms of market share, and Ubuntu for Android device will not ship. But people will begin to port Ubuntu TV to the Roku and Boxy. That's you know I'd love to put it on my Boxy because my Boxy's yeah. DOA basically. Yeah, exactly. Uh, XFCE exactly. will be the preferred uh, desktop environment for Debian, CentOS, and Scientific Linux, and other stable releases meant for servers in GNOME wanders for another year. Says uh, Wither uh, Wing. Hmm. Uh, Sibeljar says Ubuntu TV for uh, uh, for uh, and Ubuntu for Android will ship on, will not ship on any mass market. Firefox OS will not ship on any mass market device and will be abandoned. Wow. 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 Debian will debate whether to offer Mate or XFC as his primary choice. They'll eventually settle on XFCE, but Mate will go into the repos as a favorable offset for Debian users. Uh, Linux Mint will continue to grow. Klim reaches a crossroads where his de- where the demands will exceed his resources. He will try to soldier on, but will not be seen. But we will not be seen as many new features. The community will start to demand expanded development resources, and Clem will need to choose how that will happen. 
probably pretty probably accurate. Probably pretty accurate. Yeah. Apple will do something to annoy developers on its platform. Most <laughs> will stay with their Macs, but just enough will come to Linux, most likely Ubuntu. Though Apple will continue to be hostile to everyone and everything, it will become easier and easier to install Linux on a Mac, especially as a dual boot through boot camp. Apple will not be happy with that. Mm. Lots of really good ones in here. Thank you, you guys. Um, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll end with that. Elk... Elky Dory, I'm not sure. Elky Dory, I'm not Elky sure. Dory works for me. He mm. says, uh, "I like this number six one here. ButterFS will be the default on popular distros by fall." I like that he put a timeline on there. A bunch of other but really gutsy. great ones in there. Uh, the ButterFS thing, uh, I gotta own up. Made that prediction last year. Said that uh, Fedora would be shipping with ButterFS by default, but would have a bug. ButterFS just isn't ready yet. I do predict that in 2013, ButterFS will ship, and I will say it's not ready. That'll be my yeah, that's I'd my agree with that. prediction. And of course, Fedora, bug, you know, that's always an easy win. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, there was also uh, overall, overall. I mean, the real. I thought about reading them all just to drive the point home, but I decided not to. Uh, people are very down on the Ubuntu TV and Ubuntu for Android. Yeah, because no one Firefox cares. OS. Yeah, I'm, and I agree with them completely. Who cares? I mean, really. Yeah, I guess I'm just too much of a kid. I just want to. I just it's a it's it's cool for enthusiasts and people. I mean, yeah. I mean, as a you know, yeah. but but looking at it agnostically is uh, just. Joe user. Mm. Uh, you know, you know uh, uh, the uh, uh, Darunya in the chat room is asking about Lightworks. We've talked a lot about Lightworks. Yeah. I think that category is stuff. What I would love to see move over is some other big business category things. Um, we have our door. Mm -hmm. I'd love to mm -hmm. see some other professional uh, audio systems come over. Right. Some that's some, a big, that's probably the next big thing. Is the yeah, audio there's still stuff. some tools that I use for production that really aren't right. on Linux that I'd love. I'd love to see a competitor to Pro Tools and Logic. Not that our door isn't, but maybe something that's not quite so as intense as our door. I'm not sure. Uh, Fruity probably, Loops or whatever that other one is. I think that's a oh yeah. Fruity yeah. Loops would be yeah yeah stuff like that. So there you go. Uh, that is the Linux Action Show's 2013 predictions. We'll revisit these at the end of next year. And, of course, that thread in our subreddit is open. If you want to get in and toss yours in there, we'll be reviewing those, too, and taking a look what you guys have. But all right, Matt, that wraps up the Crystal Ball segment. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. But, Matt... Yes. Before we get out of here, let's bang through just a couple of emails. All right. Now, uh, I'm declaring inbox bankruptcy. Mm. So if you've sent an email and there are a lot that have not made it into the show and you still need your question answered, email us again. Because yeah. some of them are so old, I don't know if you've gotten your question answered. Now, here's a little thing. I talked about this on off air, but I think I'm serious. If I get so many emails that they'll just never fit into the show, I literally might start another show just about emails. So if don't don't hold back, let us know. And if you bury me, <laughs> God, why am I even saying this out loud? I am so asking for You're it. So, so stupid. <laughs> Anyways, you can email Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com or pop that contact link that we have up in the uh, upper corner of the uh, site or submit a thread, which is up the preferred method, mm -hmm. over on our subreddit over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. Yes. But Matt. Yes. Our first email comes from Lewis, and he has a UFI plus Arch plus Core i7 issue that Maybe we can That's some issues. get some, so chat room, put your listening yep. ears on because we need your advice on this. He says, hey guys, I recently got myself a nice Christmas present, a Lenovo X1 Carbon. The first thing I did was obviously to blow away Windows and I installed Arch Linux. However, I'm puzzled about something. I'm booting the EFI STUB, jeez, yeah. via REFIND. Everything seems to work nice and stupidly fast thanks to the SSD. However, I noticed that only four processors are shown in proc slash CPU info. The computer comes with an i7 and hyperthreading is enabled in the BIOS. Hmm. And you should see all, you should see even yeah. the hyperthreading process so. in, in the CPU info file. So th that should be there. Uh, a couple of years ago, I remember having issues when installing Arch on a MacBook Pro, where back then it was a Core 2 Duo and not properly recognized either. I'll try over the weekend using Grub2 and the usual MBR way to check whether I can get back my eight processors. Any thoughts on what could be causing this? Thanks in advance, and keep up the hard work, and I'll keep on shopping on Amazon for you. That's nice. Boy, that's awesome. So Boy, he's got UFI. Yeah. I don't know if UFI is playing a role here. I wouldn't think so. I would think it'd be a black and white situation. You'd either be using your computer or not at that point, but I, you know, that's that's news to me. I don't know. Uh, Chagrim's pointing out there could be the possibility it's a low-power i7. Maybe it doesn't have as many cores. Uh, I wonder... i7 in name only kind of thing? The other thing, it would seem like maybe a kernel-level setting. See, that's why I was kind of... I'm thinking, I'm thinking this is probably a kernel thing. 
I don't know. Maybe it could be a flag at boot. I maybe you know because you can pass commands like that at boot. Right. So I'm going to defer to uh, comments out there. But I wanted to put this out there because the reason why, even though we didn't have an answer, I still wanted to feature it. Is UEFI? It's here, folks. You know, secure boat is here. It's all here now. I mean, we're seeing it in the emails. We're mm-hmm. seeing it on the Reddit. And it came. People got Christmas presents, and these computers came with EFI wow. and Windows 8. And now we're dealing with it. So while we don't have the answers yet, I'd like to start collecting the answers, just you know, as as a community, so that way we can start helping people with mm-hmm. this. Because people got these new machines, they're going to want to put Linux on them, oh, and yeah. they're going to come to us for answers. And I want to help them. You know, this raises a bigger issue. Could this be what the Mayans were talking about? End of the world. <laughs> I'm and just, the processor cores. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know. I mean, first the processors go. You know, uh, you start losing cores. Next thing you know, I mean, uh, uh, it's just anarchy. Mm-hmm, I'm mm-hmm. Telling you. Well, and any 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 honorable man would uh, just have to uh, fall on his own sword if he doesn't have all his cores. Yeah. You know, I wonder if you're going to be blown away, anyways. <laughs> if you continue to have trouble, or or, or or hell, just do a live CD. Go into a live CD mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, like an Ubuntu live CD or whatever. Try another distro. Mm-hmm. See what you get. See what mm-hmm. you get in there. I, I'd be curious. Yeah, from a troubleshooting point of view, just yeah. d- trying to determine whether or not this is a kernel issue, a distro issue, or whether, in fact, you are i7 in name only, or what's going on. You know, I mean. uh, Nate W. in the chat room says, the X1 Carbon is a dual-core hyper-threaded. So mm. you should see four cores. Okay. Okay. Which, oh. you know, I mean, okay. there you go, right? Cool. So Pops there you off. go. All right. So that actually, so did he say he was seeing, how many cores did he say he was seeing? I don't remember. Four? Because if, he, if he's only seeing he four saw, cores. He said four, yeah. That's no good. That's just how many cores he has. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he says he noticed only four processors. So, yeah, that's... Not too bad. No, it's... Dude, you're, you're rocking fine. Dude, totally. You know, it's, it's a gift. Enjoy it, you know. All right. Bob writes in, and he says, uh, Hello, Chris and Matt. I'm a longtime fan of the show from New Zealand. We got a Bob in New Zealand. He says, uh, Lass and TechSnap are his top two podcasts. Well, he should add Coda Radio, Unfilter, Sidebite, and Show to those rotations, and then he's all set. Exactly. Uh, I would really appreciate it if you guys could do a roundup of podcast clients for Linux, especially covering those that just work, and give your comments about integration with MP3 players. If you did a review, I'd also be very pleased if you include the Bash Potter on the list as geek points for running it worthwhile. Now, we have actually yeah. done this. Yeah, we have. Uh, so search, go site, colon, Jupiter Broadcasting, and search for podcast clients mm-hmm. for Linux. But I'll just give a quick mention for G Potter. Yeah, that's a biggie. If you, if you, especially just a simplistic uh, GUI option. And uh, if you want to go a little more advanced, Subsonic is a fun one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's just pretty hardcore. It. Uh, and there was a Bash script that I featured a while back. Now that I'm using Subsonic, I don't use that Bash script anymore. Yeah. And I can't remember the name. It wasn't Bash Potter. It was something else. But uh, yeah, it was it was great. And of course. Any of the, uh, you know, uh, Amarok, Rhythmbox, Banshee, oh, all yeah. of those are going to do it really, really well. I personally prefer G Potter. Yeah. I wish the G Potter developers would list the Linux Action Show, you know, the world's largest Linux podcast that's been around for six plus years. I wish they would list that in their directory. G Potter devs, you're listening. Now's a good time. Uh, if you know anybody there, if you could pass that along, that would be appreciated because mm-hmm. you'd think people on Linux might like that. But, Just saying. Uh, yeah. I would probably recommend it more often, but my own show isn't featured in there, which is just, I don't get that. Uh, so G Potter is great, uh, but I honestly, if you can handle it, I know Matt's not going to agree with me on this. Subsonic's a lot of fun. It That's what yeah, I use cool. now. It's cool. It's cool. I don't use it myself that much, but yeah, you know, it's cool. And I, I use, I think it's called Pocket Cast on Android. Pocket, I actually, yeah. Yeah. to be totally honest, because I tend to listen to podcasts on the road, I tend to use Pocket Cast I do. myself. All yeah. right, uh, just a quick uh, community announcement from Ohio Linux Fest. Mm. They are looking for people to fill out a survey, it, uh, especially if you were an attendee from 2012. Yeah. It's just a couple, literally a couple of questions, and they're just trying to get an idea of uh, what they need to prepare for for the 2013 Ohio Fest. Mm. Cool. Now, our local Linux Fest is coming up. I, it is. I oh, assume God, we're going. Already? Right? Yeah, I'm going. Yeah. I'll go. Yeah, you should let me know. I I'm... hope people out there are going. If you guys uh, are thinking about attending Linux Fest Northwest towards the end of April up here in Bellingham, Washington, let us know. I'd love to meet up with you been guys. Been going off and on since like 03, yeah. 04. Oh, yeah, something. a long time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I've been going, yeah, for a really long time. Uh, mm-hmm. This, gosh, wow. Uh, all right. So now we, our last email is a book pick just to wrap us up because we don't, mm-hmm. we don't mention books too Not often. Not too often. Show. No. Uh, so uh, Darren writes in. He says, hey, guys, love the show. I'm sort of new to Linux. I bought Lindos back in the day and ran it for a while before giving up and returning to Windows. Anyways, I just got the Ubuntu Made Easy book for Ubuntu 12.04. Wow, was I very impressed. Within 10 days, 
I'd done a permanent install and played around with other distros for the next few weeks. For the nice. past month or so on Ping iOS has been my distro. It's really quite excellent. Keep up the great work. That's a great success story. That's right. I looked at Ubuntu Made Easy, and I haven't tried it myself, but what I like a lot about it is, uh, I was talking about this on the uh, live stream, uh-huh. is it's a project-based method to learning. Now, the only problem I think, Matt, you'd agree with me on these books is these Linux books can get outdated really fast. They can get outdated really fast. I, it, the problem with Linux books is if you're talking about like more of the granular stuff that's a little more timeless, it, you know, they're, they're great. They're yeah. awesome. But when you're dealing with desktops, especially like, uh, you know, Ubuntu, where like when Unity first came out, it just rendered all, all the, the books. old books completely useless. Yeah, focused, yeah. Yeah, and so, it, you know. So I think you got to act kind of yeah. fast. You got to, you know, you got to, you when the distros come out, you kind of have to get the books that have been right. written for that. Some of the skills you learn, though, still apply to all the future updates. They do. It's a skill set you learn. And yep. The ones that I think are the best are the ones, like the one here that Darren's recommending. This Ubuntu Made Easy option. book is a project-based uh, training method where you set yourself a goal, and then you learn everything you need to learn to get to there. And I was just saying right. on the stream that that's how I learned server-side Linux is my first two jobs were set up a Samba server and set up a Squid Proxy server. Wow. And I had to learn everything between being told to do that or deciding right. to do that, in my case, deciding to do that, and then going from this is an idea to actually implementing it was a huge learning path. And right. if I didn't have that goal at the end, I wouldn't have had to travel through some of that that's stuff. That's true. And that's why I think the project-based introductions are a great way to go. So if you've been thinking about it, it might be worth trying. We'll put a link to it yeah. in the show notes. And if you grab that, it'll be an affiliate link, so it'll support the show. Good stuff. All right, Matt. Well, the Linux Action Show is live on Sundays at 10 a.m. Pacific. Oh, we had somebody oh, that wanted oh. to know uh, what times those were around the world. So oh, I'll just list off a couple. You got your clock all out. Yeah, he's rocking. Well, yeah, I was going to say that was actually, I think it was uh, it was the previous emailer. He wanted. He says he wants to watch live from New Zealand, but he never knows what time it is. So uh, chat room, if you could give out your time zone and what time it is when the Linux Action Show goes live, that'd be awesome. But anyways, we go yep. live at 10 a.m. over jblive.tv for the video or jblive.info for the audio stream. And uh, so that is, uh, there you go. Look at that. That's, that's 3 a.m. in Perth at 7 a.m. in New Zealand. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, that's... Uh, uh, it's uh, 6 p.m. in the UK, and it's 7 p.m. Central Time. Really? No, it's not. No, 7 it's not. p.m. Central? No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> Wait, no, that's not Central. That's CET. That might be... Uh, oh, 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 okay, okay. okay uh, that's yeah, something yeah. else. It's negative 7 GMT, which is 11 a.m., mm. so that would be uh, like, uh, what? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we're negative eight. So I don't know. We're we're uh, the Linux action show specific time, so we're negative eight at ten a.m. So there you go. Wow. It's twelve p.m. CST. That's that's a, yeah. It's yeah. a CET with something yeah. else. Yes, yes. I guess time math and one p.m. Eastern time. So if you're able to join us, it's great. Thank you to the yeah. chat room, you guys. You know we're we're constantly referring to you guys for information. Mm-hmm. It's live corrections. It's live interactions. It's challenging, and then we love it. Uh, the show is often. Uh, considerably longer when you watch us live because we take breaks in between the segments and chat for a while yep. and stretch our legs and and things like that. So Make it's, noise. It's yeah. a lot more show if you show up live, and uh, that's just kind of a fun little extra. There's a lot of craziness that happens behind the scenes you should check out. Trust <laughs> who, me. Who, us, Matt? No. Never, never. All right, well, uh, so uh, what, can, what can people find you? What, what are you up to this week? What can people find well, you? Well, as always, you can find me at matthartley.com for some of my archived articles, and for the more recent stuff, datamation.com. Scroll down to open source. And just click on my stuff there. Nice, Matt. Nice. Well, uh, you know, uh, we're uh, we're back almost to a full swing this week. Uh, Sidebite will still be out for one more week, but other other than that, the holiday schedule is over for Jupiter Broadcasting, and all of the shows are back. I hope everyone out there has a fantastic, amazing New Year's. I hope you had a great holiday. Sorry the last episode, our ending segment got cut off. And uh, stay safe on the roads. <laughs> yeah, definitely stay safe on the roads because we need you to come back and watch us right back right. here next week. <laughs> I don't know what that was. That was scary. <laughs> soft skin, Matt. I have soft skin yeah. in there. Good to know. That's what she said. <laughs> Been there.